If you look at earnings, top line, growth of revenue, we've started to see some weakness there. The equity market has become more expensive in absolute terms and more expensive relative to fixed income. Markets are a little bit more volatile right now than the underlying economy is. Ultimately, you will get to an earnings reset. We think that's part of next year's narrative. I think that you have to look for opportunities and things that have struggled as you go into 2024. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. I'm alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market totally unchanged on the S&P 500. A one-two punch to sentiment yesterday, snapping an eight-day winning streak on the S&P. TK, 1 p.m., we had a sloppy bond auction. 2 p.m., Chairman Powell. Oh, Chairman Powell, would you close the door over there, please? Close the door. Close the Pl Eric, door. Eric, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> Close the else. door. I think he said a What was more important, the auction yesterday, the comments of the chairman of the Who Federal Reserve? Who wants to translate that for no. people that might have missed it? No, Close okay. The, mm, okay. Door. Okay. Close the door. <laughs> was that good? Chairman Powell's address, let's just say, was disrupted by some climate protesters. And he said, Close yesterday. the door. And he politely said, Close the door. Did he close the door on the Fed put yesterday? That's the key question. That is the big question, yeah. Tom. He left open the door, I think, to another rate move. But ultimately, did he really say anything different to the week before? I think Mike Faroli over at JP Morgan has put it fairly well. Well, in terms of what he said relative to market expectations, it reads hawkish, Tom, compared to what the market was looking for. Given we're talking about a market yeah. pricing in a bunch of cuts in 2024. We had a pullback after eight days straight up. I think we're, we're doing it. I looked at a lot of technical charts this morning and to link all this in together. And I, I'm fascinated, Lisa, what you think. Let's get it out of the way right now. Bramo right. Tom wrong. That's what happened here. 30 year auction did matter. But I looked at the technicals and the yield stayed constrained within the recent pattern. It's not like we had a breakout to a new high yield. We just sort of moved. Look, we have no clue. And I think that that was really the conclusion from the past 24 hours, because what we got was an auction that by some measures was the worst on record in terms of the yield that it traded yes. at after the yields that it was trading at before the auction. OK, so that was bad. A lot of bad internal technicals. Then Fed Chair Powell comes out and says the same thing with a different emphasis that he said before, which is we're going to respond to the data. But this time we might be more hawkish. And everyone says, oh, my goodness, it's different. It was not different. But the fact that there was such a big response leaves people scratching their heads and pointing to conspiracy theories like ransomware attacks for the possibility that that's what's been disrupting the bond market. This just highlights how little we know, John. Well, let's get into it. So ICBC, world's largest bank, is going around Manhattan with a USB stick settling treasury trades. Is that right? Basically, uh, for, uh, <clears throat> I believe, the night before, right, it had been going on for quite a while. It's very unusual for a bank to get hit with a ransomware attack where they basically have to pay off the hackers to release some of their systems. And some of their counterparties had chopped off the access to uh, their systems because they didn't want to be infected. And so in order to transact, they were walking around hand delivering USB sticks to try to make these whole. A very okay. lack of clarity, I would say, with all of the articles that I've read around how much has actually disrupted the market so, liquidity. So the Bloomberg covers today, what does the cyber, the vaunted cyber departments of America's big banks do? How do we respond to this? Do we say, oh, those Chinese, you know, it's them, it's not us, or is this a really whole new tone? So arguably at the moment, we have no idea what's going on. Based on certain reports, it's Lockbit, a criminal gang with ties to Russia suspected of the attack. But Tom, I think it speaks to a broader concern. Worry. Been worried about these kind of issues for a long, long yeah. time. And that's why banks have been investing in these kinds of issues for a long, long time. But more broadly, Bramo has picked up on the right theme here in the bond market. Absolutely spooked by big swings right. in treasuries. Same again yesterday. A 20 basis point plus move on a 30 year bond following a sloppy auction. Lisa, we've been asking the question all week. Have we confused a bond market rally over the last two weeks with bond market stability because nothing about yesterday looks stable. I was thinking about you in that point that you make uh, yesterday when I saw that 22 point swing in a 22 basis point swing in 30 year yields. It raises this question, what's really going on and is the lack of certainty that people okay. have around this going to tamp down the potential by the dip that we saw for a half but second to, in the bond market? To Global Wall Street and for our audience on radio and television, it isn't part of the game. The people in the game are worried about one word, and that's liquidity. And I'm going to suggest part of it is maybe going into year end, but I wonder how deep the market is right now. And to go to the 30 year auction, which I got wrong, there's going to be another one, right? There's another auction coming up, right? 
the oh, seven year, the two year, the hundred yeah, yeah. year, whatever. Year. It's going to be fascinating now to see how they well, sustain. A lot of people complain there wasn't a hundred year a couple of years ago. Let's start with the price action this morning. Good morning to you. Equities look like this on the S&P 500. We snapped that eight day winning streak on the S&P in yesterday's session. As it stands, coming into Friday, we're down just a touch on a week on the S&P, heading towards a weekly loss. Yields are higher by a couple of basis points on a 10-year 4.64. Looking at crude at the moment, WTI 76. We're bouncing back by nine-tenths of 1%. I do want to sit on the dollar just for a moment, yes, TK. Yes, thank you. Right, right, the euro, 106.87. So the euro's bouncing back. As of yesterday, the dollar index was heading for its best week since July. Some dollar strength kicking in against G10, even with this equity move that's developed, Tom, over the past week. Well, it's, it's a dollar move, and I'll go with that. But and we haven't talked enough about this. It's my fault and that we haven't talked about euro yen. Take out the dollar and look at this odd relationship. And if you'd said a week ago, John, that we'd be popping a 162 on euro yen, 161.83 right now, that's a persistently weaker yen. And on a Friday, you got to get to Sunday night, the morning in Japan. I mean, when do they finally blink and act? We're way past that looking at Euro Yen. As you speak, Tom, Euro Yen, session highs on that currency pair. Yeah. So that's a weaker Japanese Yen. Lisa, that currency pair positive by 0.2%. Yeah, we've been hearing about money coming out of Japan and going into the U.S. and going into U.S. bonds in particular. For your so, auction, they showed uh, up. Raises, <laughs> raises some questions. Close they might have shown the up. Door. Maybe they just, all oh, right, really. <laughs> 7.30 a.m. Honestly, we've been talking all about Fed speak and we make fun of all the Fed speakers, but it's not isolated to the U.S. It's all around the world. ECB President Christine Lagarde is speaking today at an event in London at 7.30 a.m. Also at 7.30, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan. And 90 minutes later, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic to speak. Does it matter, right? Maybe if they emphasize the right words, people will pick up on it and trade and then blame those trades. I mean, that's basically uh, where we are at this point. Today is day two of discussions between Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and China Vice Premier He Feng in San Francisco. This is ahead of next week's meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping. Very curious to hear how this sets up the contours for what's going to be discussed next week. How much can we lower the bar? Is anyone paying attention to this meeting at all? I mean, is this on your radar at all, John? This one, no. Next week, yes. Is it fair to say? I think this lands, lays the groundwork for next week. And a lot of people, Bramo, expecting some kind of charm offensive from Chinese officials with the United States, given the foreign direct investment data we've seen in the yes. past weeks, which is uh, not encouraging for the Chinese economy. Which I think is interesting, the, the balance of leverage here. Then at 10 a.m., what this team really particularly always uh, focuses on, the University of Michigan <coughs> Sentiment Survey, how much do we see a deterioration in sentiment uh, with respect to, to inflation at a time when we are seeing inflation coming down? We do see signs that the economy is slowing, especially in, given that we are also expecting some sort of forward look Right. For inflation, five to ten. And John, years. this comes out. I was going to do this. This Anyone? is a little bit off the radar here, but the just United, keep talking, Bramac. United, United <laughs> Kingdom <laughs> GDP. <laughs> United Kingdom GDP. And I loved what Nabarro over at Citigroup said. He said the quality of growth, and that goes to the Michigan survey. What is the quality of growth in America? What is the quality of growth in the United Kingdom at right now? And essentially, that's into next week in retail sales and CPI. I can tell you right now, the level of growth in America is so much better than the level of growth yeah. in Europe. And a lot of people might point towards the fiscal action that took place in the last few years. The price we've got to pay for that, of course, was higher inflation. We're looking for CPI next week. The politics of all of this is absolutely fascinating. We've got a new poll out, Bloomberg News and Morning Consult. Take a listen to some of the bullet points from this. About three times as many voters said immigration is their top issue in the 2024 presidential contest as those who said the same about the Israel-Hamas war. Now, Bramo, just to go through some of the numbers here, some 68% of respondents said they approve of funding for border protection, a larger share than the 61% who back aid to Israel or 58% who favour aid to Ukraine. That really sets things up, I think, going into an election year for President Biden and the GOP. Especially when you pair it with other polls, including those done by uh, Bloomberg and Morning Consult that talk about the rise of independence, that talk about uh, this distaste for a Biden-Trump uh, sort of rematch. What I think is interesting is this comes just as Joe Manchin uh, drops out, says he's not going to announce a re-election bid, and there are people saying maybe we're going to see a Joe Manchin, Mitt Romney ticket running as independents, which could really throw a wrench into the matter considering the taste uh, right now on both sides for both potential candidates. Again, when you take a look at this, who wins from this? I'm not sure. Manchin was very vague yesterday. Yes, he was. Just to share the quote from the senator from West Virginia, what I will be doing is traveling the country 
and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle and bring America together. He's going to travel the country. Mm. It's going to be one of those things, Bramo. Just sort of like a listening tour, if you will, TK. Oh, they're all doing Just that right now. They're all the out in Iowa doing listening and have a listen to a Bramo. whole What's lot of listening. Do? Is he going to rent, you know, an RV and go around? And sit the different Yeah, that's called doing campfire. Charles Corral. Sure. You know, he's going to have van life. I, 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 I vote for life. someone in the middle right now. I really urge people to look at this Bloomberg poll article. I think it's got some fabulous charts. And, John, I'm going to go back to what we talked about yesterday. I'm not sure foreign policy as part of the debate in November next year. Texas border is a domestic issue to a lot of people. People yesterday emphasizing the economy and inflation matter. Israel, Ukraine, Gaza, Taiwan. Are they going to matter in the voting booth? This is a real challenge for the president. Yeah. So the GOP are going to take a much harder line on the border. And clearly that's polling well, based on our poll this morning. The president wants to maintain America's role on the international stage to support two military fronts at the same time, Ukraine, Israel. At least so clearly one is a lot more popular than the other. Now, I mean, again... And that can is, change, of and course can it can. Change. And I think that, you know... At this point, it's good to get these sort of tea leaves to understand how things are stacking up and what's important to people. How much this can change, given that we've had 14 narrative shifts in the past three days and the fact that basically the events are transpiring more quickly than we can keep our handle on, gives you a sense of, uh, you know, just the shifting landscape. It is November 10th-ish, and I guess Monday, I'm not even sure what day Monday is, 11, 12, but all of a sudden that break, that moment, November 15th, is on us. To me, that's the end of the the business year, the parties start, and there were studies and the outlooks for next year and all that. And I had no idea 90 days ago we'd be in such a jumble coming up on November 15th and the November 17th government shutdown, which is well, precisely. clearly in the zeitgeist this morning in Washington. There might be Christmas parties elsewhere, Tom. I'm not <clears> sure <throat> if there'll be any down in Washington, yeah. D.C. As for 12 months, 12 months is a long, long time. I keep reflecting on the note that came out from Goldman Sachs and Jan Hatzius in the last couple of days. What if Jan's right? What if Jan Hatzius is right and you get this extension of the cycle, you get a continuation of the disinflation that we've seen so far? What a different story we'd be telling about the US economy, Bramo, going into the November election compared to the one that we're selling right now. I would argue that would be a perfect scenario for President Biden, of course, who knows, because again, all of the other events that come around it. But if you think about disinflation, you think about a strong economy and managing to land this thing, that would actually set him up in a much better position than maybe currently is seen in some of the polls. Hatsius makes it sound easy. He said, the hard part is over. We continue to see only limited recession risk. We expect several tailwinds to growth, an increased willingness to cut, even if growth slows. That last point yesterday. An increased willingness to cut even if growth slows. I think this is what Mike Faroli over at JP Morgan is getting right. at. It's not like the message changed from Chairman Powell yesterday. It's that well, the market expected something else compared to what and, it got. And on the math on this, and Faroli's the one to quote, you, you nailed that, because the guy from the Booth School of Chicago was, really was out front on analysis of potential GDP. And people like Hot, this is important, folks, people like Hotzius and Faroli are subduing their view. 1.8% GDP, is that normal? A 4.2% unemployment rate, is that high? These are guesses we're making into not only next year, but 2026. Which is the reason why, and given the guesses, people took such a signal from the tone of Jay Powell, to your point, last week. They heard from him an openness to understand uh, that the economy was slowing and that the rates, that the restrictiveness was much higher uh, than otherwise <laughs> implied because of that. He hinted at that yesterday, but again, the emphasis was on, we're not sure if we could have to do more. We're not even talking about cuts. Stop being so Close bullish that. on this. Close exactly. That. Close the door to mm. rate cuts. Door. Something like that, yeah. Here's your next hour on Bloomberg TV. Coming up very shortly, we'll catch up with AMH down in Washington, D.C. on the latest poll. Later on this morning, Christian Horner of Oracle Red Bull Racing. That's in the next hour, right here on Bloomberg Surveillance. I've made one of the toughest decisions of my life and decided that I will not be running for re-election to the United States Senate. But what I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle. I'm gonna go with him. Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia announcing his retirement from the Senate in a video posted 
on X in the last 24 hours. Would you like to travel the country, TK? Let's travel the country. He's going to do a Charles Corral and get the pace there. But the middle thing is, a, you know, we can go into this with Anne Marie, but the, the definition of the middle right now is open to a lot of debate. Hey, that's Many true. people would say true. the middle has swung right here. And you really wonder, you know, we use the word too much, but the mansion calculus in West Virginia must be a fascinating story. Doesn't mansion have a boat? He has a boat, doesn't he? I think he should get a van. I think he should represent the van. the van life movement here in America and embrace it. Seen and a really lot of those videos. You've seen those videos? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People it's, it's convert the popular. van, they tour the country. Exactly. I, I love that. Organize it in a really Just awesome unplug, way. Get well, off except, the grid. Yeah, and then they take pictures and post it on their social media. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they're not quite unplugging, are they? <laughs> OK. Equities on the S&P 500, slightly negative this morning. On the S&P, we're pulling back just a touch. We snapped that eight-day winning streak in yesterday's session. Sloppy 30-year <clears> bond auction. Chairman Powell, just repeating what Chairman Powell said the week before, but ultimately maybe with a different meeting, given the easing that we've seen. It carries a different meaning, apparently. TK yields higher by a couple of basis points. 464.19 on a 10-year. On a 30-year, we're higher by three basis points at about 479. Can we just check out shares of Richmond? Coming out with earnings a little bit earlier on today, not great. We're down about 6.8%. I thought this line really stood out for me. I don't know about you guys, but the chairman of Richemont basically saying that the luxury industry won't put up prices for two years. So if they've lost price in power, Bramo, who's left? Well, it, again, this goes actually to something that we've been talking about a lot, which is where is the demand coming from? Is it from the middle class people who are stretching or is it for the wealthy individuals who sense that there's some kind of problem around the corner? Two different kinds of uh, right. scenarios here, or is it because of something else? like people moving away from watches. I'm not sure because we haven't seen it across all luxury. We have seen Hermes post really good results. So on the other hand, it hasn't been consistent. But there are these warning signals across all of the earning spheres. You can find the pockets, the anecdotes to point to exactly what you're talking about. If you go back and look at the stock charts, they're, they're cyclical like this. There is a cyclical nature where people pull back from luxury. But to your point, Lisa, we say luxury where there's actually four or five subsets of luxury. Richemont, like carrying hugely challenged with Gucci right now, they're across a set of those subsets. You know, they're in three, four, five universes where you mentioned Hermes, which is just choosing not to be in those lower level luxury subsets. Lots of complaints about entry level leather goods and the like across luxury, Tom, not doing as yeah. well. Also, you mentioned the watch business. The pandemic watch boom is over. It's just... Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you know, the way we look at this, folks, is we look at Lisa's closet. It's full. I mean, Amory Horton's closet. Well, you can ask Closets AMH plural. personally about that. She's got ask, closets ask in all of, four districts of Washington. Ask Amory if the Bauman boom is over. We'll, we'll ask yeah. her right now. Let's do this. Let's <laughs> see, we're going to conflate two stories together here uh, this morning. We have a wonderful Bloomberg poll, some real acuity about where we are 12 months out from an election. And also, of course, uh, Mr. Manchin's comments from West Virginia. Joining us now, Amory Horton, Bloomberg Luxury Correspondent in, in Washington. Let's get that out of the way, Amory, right now. Is luxury so uh, yesterday? Is it over in Washington? I don't know if it was ever alive in Washington, but there is a sale at the moment, private sale, if you know who to know, at Balma, so you can go check that out. There we um, go. You're, 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 you're weekend shopping with Emery uh, Horton. <laughs> Emery, I, I want to conflate these two together. I've got Joe Manchin, who has lived 50 percent votes in West Virginia from the special election of Robert Byrd, 53 percent, eight years ago. Just to cut to the chase before the poll chat, did he make this decision because he really thought he couldn't win? I think that's part of it. If you look at a recent Emerson poll and you have him against Republican Governor Jim Justice. He's trailing by about 13 points. This was going to be an incredibly challenging race for him. And he's already flirted with the fact that this was going to be the end of his right. time in the Senate. He's <clears throat> talked about the fact that he does think there needs to be a conversation about the middle. But also, you have to look at the reality of what he's facing in West Virginia, and that was likely going to be a defeat. Gregory Courtney and Marlowe writing up our poll piece. It'll be talked about, I know, across all of your world today. Is there a middle in our Bloomberg poll, or does it show this mass polarity? Is the Joe Manchin middle out there in the Bloomberg poll? Well, there absolutely is, because there's one key finding when it comes to RFK, and that's that he is taking from both. When you look at 2020 voters, he's definitely taking from Biden. But when you look at how voters feel right now, he is attracting Democrats because of his name cachet, right? He's a Kennedy. But he is also attracting Trump voters. And that has a lot to do with the fact that he is a 
a lot of uh, dialogue over the past two years when it comes to when it comes to COVID-19 and this anti-vax movement. So he has 10 percent. He has obviously a ton of name ID and recognition. But there is this idea of what we're calling, quote, double haters. And that's about 19 percent we're seeing in our poll. And that's people who don't like the current president, Joe Biden, and definitely don't like the former president, Donald Trump. Double haters. I love that. I think we're going to have to use that. There is this question as I look through some of the poll results about how President Biden could turn this around. We have a year left. Is there some material uh, policy projection that you can hear about from the Democrats coalescing around the border, some sort of bipartisan agreement to try to deal with some of the problems that people are highlighting? So I think there's two things that stand out here. One is that overwhelmingly in this poll of swing state voters, they want to see more being done at the southern border. It's 68 percent to 20 percent in terms of 20 percent disapprove of what's being done. When you look at the disapproval across things like Israel, Ukraine, that that number um, is, is more. So what you're seeing here is that not a lot of people, a lot of people really want to see more work being done on the southern border. But Biden has put this all together in one big bill. And potentially, because people are less concerned about, say, what's going on in Ukraine or China at the moment, that they are fine with having these separate bills, what we see Republicans are trying to do. I'd also note that this is a hard line for the president to walk right now, because still in our poll, like our poll showed last month, the economy rates number one. More than 40 percent of respondents say that is their top priority. When you look at the foreign policy concerns, one percent care about China. Three percent care about what's going on in Israel. So immigration, the economy, abortion, those are ranking much higher in this poll. And can I just ask a stupid question? Is it when we talk about economy, are we just talking about inflation? Well, that's what people are feeling, because the data shows that there's a lot of other optimism happening in the economy. This administration continues to use the superlative that for 21 months, the unemployment rate has been below 4 percent. That is a huge achievement, and that shows that we do have a very strong labor market. But time and time again, what people are concerned with is price of gasoline, price of groceries, their price of rental insurance that spiked over the summer. Mark Zandi in September came out and talked about the fact that before the pandemic, where prices are now, an average family that is making medium income is paying $734 more. And that's yep. the problem with what the president is saying. The economy is doing better and people are just not feeling it. MH, how frustrated is this White House with these polls? Very frustrated. The president was asked about it yesterday, and he says, you're just looking at CNN, you're just looking at New York Times. Well, this is our second right. Bloomberg News morning consult poll that right. focuses on the states that matter. These are the states that win elections. Right. I think what the White House feels right now or the campaign feels right now is that Tuesday they had a great night. But Tuesday was all about abortion. And is that going to be top of mind of voters come November of next year? These are very interesting races. In Virginia, right. Glenn Youngkin made it about a 15-week limit. In Kentucky, it was kind of a unicorn governor race. And then in Ohio, it was specifically about abortion. And when you have Roe v. Wade being struck down by the Supreme Court, it means that the states are looking at abortion. So these were very state-specific issues. You know, I, I look, Amory, I thought you're dead on on the Zandy point. To me, the inflation is not the statistics we talk about on Bloomberg surveillance, it's a level from 2019. I think everyone out there, including me, is looking at every single item back to late 2019, very early 2020, and that's how you get to that $700 paycheck. Couldn't statistic. agree more, Tom. That's the issue, TK. I, I, I just, to me, it's Without the heart of the matter. AMH, thank you. Amory, yeah. down in Washington, D.C., on the latest. We'll catch up with AMH on that poll a little bit later. Tom, without a doubt, that's the issue. Yeah, to what about price change year over year? People are comparing what they're paying now to what they paid before the pandemic. I am, sh you know, I'm so fortunate. You know what? I'm shocked when I look at groceries. I, you know, every item, I, I just stun at what it's become over. The conversation years. continues. Ian Shepperton of Pantheon, <coughs> macroeconomics, your equity market, just slightly negative this Friday morning. From New York, good morning.
You're almost there. One more trading day to go. On the S&P 500, we look like this going into the weekend. Equity futures pulling back just a touch, down a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq, down by 0.2%. Yesterday, snapping an eight-day winning streak on the S&P 500. We had nine days of gains on the Nasdaq. Responsible for the move higher. Also responsible for the move lower in the bond market, two year, 10 year, 30 year, with a big, big focus yesterday on the 30 year maturity. Very sloppy auction. 478 is the yield right now, up a couple of basis points this morning. Yesterday at one point, Bramo, higher by more than 20 basis points following that mess, that debacle in the afternoon. So we've been asking, is it over? Have we gotten some calm back to the bond market? And the answer is no. Do we know why? No. We can have five different reasons and explanations, including conspiracy theories that are percolating out this morning. But the real question for me is, when is it going to end? What kind right. of economic data point will it take <clears throat> to have some clarity on the path going forward? Yeah, close the door over there and please put up the Bramo banner, Bramo correct, Tom wrong. So what's the next step with the 30 year? There's a 30 year auction every every four times a year? There, well, there's gonna days? be, in, in a number of weeks, there will be more. But right now, what we are looking to is really CPI next week. It's the economic data as it comes out. And frankly, just understanding some of the technicals underpinning this, when I talk about conspiracy theories, John, we're talking about uh, you know the ICBC and uh, the unit in the U.S. of this Chinese bank and a question around hacking and whether this had any effect whatsoever on liquidity in markets. The fact that we're even entertaining that to the degree <laughs> that we are highlights the lack of certainty. Mohammed said yesterday, Mohammed al if even if the Fed is done, this volatility is not. You're going to have to live with this maybe for a while. This volatility going into next year. amid low liquidity. Maybe the most interesting, you know, geek global Wall Street quote this week was uh, Dean Kernett with an, a NASDAQ VIX of 19.01. Yes, it's elevated in the last 24 hours. But the quiet out there and measurement of volatility and liquidity, these statistics give pause to a lot of people on Wall Street. We'll return to that ICB story in just a moment. I want to finish on foreign exchange and just take a look at the euro against the dollar. The DXY, the dollar index, four days of strength, four days of strength coming into Friday. A bit weaker against the euro this morning at 106.79, but we've had a real week of dollar strength, Bramo, off the back of equities doing okay, which is interesting. And it's something uh, that Neil Kashkari pointed to as the dark matter of the uncertainty of why yields were higher, because normally when you have worries about fiscal policy, you wouldn't see strength in the currency. And he thought that was unusual. I think it's interesting. Under surveillance this morning, your top stories, Israel saying it's agreed to limited pauses in Gaza Strip fighting, falling short of what the U.S. held as a significant agreement for a <laughs> daily four-hour halt. The Israeli military estimating between 50,000 to 100 100,000 people, Tom, have exited northern Gaza in the last few days. A movable feast here into the weekend. And what struck me within, you know, we're all reading the war coverage as we can. Some real courageous people, people giving us that uh, coverage is we're having all these discussions of humanitarian issues in what I believe is hand-to-hand -hand combat in tunnels. I, I mean, you know, they're, they're underground fighting, which is frightening. There's the war on the ground, and there are the deaths, and there's the tragedy, and then there's the war in information worlds that has been yeah, unseen put, before. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is what's really caught my attention over the past couple of days, a number of reports highlighting uh, some very clear efforts in miscommunication and disinformation from lots of different corners around the world. And this question around how we get a handle on what's truth and what's not. And to me, this is something that I'm focusing more and more on because this is a new regime and a new front at a time of fast moving information. Including domestically here in the United States of America as well. Let's turn to our next story. The world's biggest bank, ICBC, having to trade through a USB thumb drive after its U.S. unit was hit by a cyber attack, the hack leaving the Chinese bank unable to clear U.S. Treasury trades and forcing it to send settlement details across Manhattan with a courier carrying a USB stick. <laughs> Lockbit, a criminal gang with ties to Russia suspected of launching this attack, Lisa. And to your point, given how spooked people were yesterday afternoon by that sloppy 30-year bond auction, some people trying to work out whether this contributed to that mess. And we have no clarity on that, to be very clear. Very little. And and this hack had shut down some of the systems as early as later on Wednesday night. So this would have affected trading volumes earlier in the day, ostensibly. Again, the details the, are lacking, in my opinion. The details are lacking here, but isn't the arch issue of any bank of any nation? Do they pay these criminal actors? Do they, do they, is there like a That's what the criminal fee? actors would like. Yeah. Yes. 
I mean, I, I wonder how that's governed. Do they just do it secretly? Is it, you know, is it is it like you looking at real estate in Manhattan, and suitcases <laughs> of euros and pounds and? What other? are you trying to start? <laughs> Just for the record, I rent. <laughs> He's no, not out there. There are no houses in my name. One, two punch to sentiment yesterday. One was that sloppy bond auction. Two was this. Fed Chair Jay Powell warning the central bank won't hesitate to raise rates. Speaking at the IMF conference in Washington saying, quote, close the... No. Yeah. If it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do so. We will continue to move carefully. However, allowing us to address both the risk of being misled by a few good months of data and the risk of over-tightening. On a serious note, there was another interruption to a Chairman Powell address. We saw this at the Economic Club of New York only a couple of weeks ago. This time around, again, by climate protesters. Chairman Powell with a hot mic walking off stage saying, close the door. She thought it was a real authentic moment for the Federal Reserve Chairman. <laughs> you know? 100%. Tom, so tightly scripted all the time. And then you actually get to see yeah. just a reflection of the emotion of the guy. Incredibly frustrated. Mm -hmm. You turned up to deliver an address, be part of a panel, and then that happens. But then we have a, do we have a new level of protest now, invasive? I actually personally witnessed this, the thing I was doing with Michael Frome and now running CFR. He was with the government in public service, and we had protesters within six inches of us before. I mean, I've been, I've been on stage afraid. Their, their faces were this far from me. Honestly, I think that he doesn't come out looking too bad because his frustration is so relatable. I think what his comments really highlighted to me also responds to something that we've been talking about. Our Fed official is going to come out and try to tick by tick jawbone the market into tighter or looser financial they're, kind they're of conditions. And that's essentially, yes, what data? Are they looking at bond yields? Are they looking at stocks? Are they saying, you know, now things are getting a little hot? I don't know. Pump the brakes. We're going to get to our guest now who's going to help us with this debate. Ian Shepherdson is fabulous, chief economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics with a real focus on China macroeconomics as well. Ian, I love your phrase. I'm going to steal it from you. The royalty check will be in the mail to pay for the Newcastle uh, tickets. We're looking at our pending immaculate disinflation. Is our immaculate disinflation in place right now? I think it is, but I'm not surprised that Chair Powell is not yet ready to say so in public. Uh, I, I, you know, the remarks he made yesterday were kind of a, a slightly more amped up version of what he's been saying for a while, which is that, yeah, the recent data have been good, but they're not yet definitive. And uh, I think they're very nervous about declaring victory and then having to undeclare victory. My guess is that that wouldn't happen. I think actually this disinflation is pretty deeply embedded now. But this is a Fed that really made a hash of things with the great transitory uh, fiasco. And they can't afford to be wrong again, you know, in the same cycle, in the same direction. That would look like they didn't learn from the first time around. So they need to maintain this optionality. And they need, I think, you know, every, every couple of weeks they're going to keep reminding us <laughs> until they stop that uh, you know, the inflation might come back and that they can't yet be sure and that, yeah, we'll hike again if we have to. So uh, markets took it badly because we've had such an enormous rally in stocks and bonds. But, but fundamentally, I don't think he said anything very new. He's just reminding us that, yeah, you know, there's still a chance that we might have to hike. I don't think they will, but he's not going to let go of it yet. They're certainly not going to have a conversation about rate cuts anytime soon, Ian, based on what you just said. But ultimately, do you think there's reason to tolerate some kind of easing of financial conditions? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I'm not at all concerned that the easing of financial conditions in the last couple of weeks is somehow dangerous or that it's going to spark any sort of resurgence in inflation, because I think the underlying disinflation forces are pretty deeply embedded now across the whole U.S. economy. And in fact, that applies in, in Europe and other places as well. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. But um, maybe it just went a little bit too fast for some people at the Fed. You know, there are, there are still some hawks there. And of course, Chair Powell, you know, has to juggle the views of a fairly wide spectrum of opinion across the FOMC. So, uh, you know, he just wanted, I think, to dampen things down a little bit. And, and of course, they've said over and over again that they're not talking about cutting yet. Well, yeah, no one thinks they're going to be cutting yet. But um, the real question <laughs> to me is what they're saying maybe in three or four months time if we get more good inflation data and more soft payroll numbers and more lower wage gains numbers then you know then the conversation will shift but i think chair powell is very keen right now on not letting that conversation happen in a way that he would consider to be premature there may be more messy bond auctions as well ian let's talk about it michael shaw of market field asset management sat in this chair just across from me a couple of weeks back and he talked about what was happening just in terms of supply coming to market and the way the bond market was responding to it. And he suggested, Ian, that maybe this Federal Reserve might have to move away from QT. Ian, what's your view on that now, given developments in the last 24 hours? 
Uh, yeah, I don't think we're quite at that point yet, but, but there's no question that the, uh, the question, or the question, the QT question is something that I'm hearing increasingly from people in markets. You know, how much longer can they carry on taking 20 billion out every week, you know, over a trillion dollars a year at this steady pace when the funding requirement is so pretty big? Uh, and as you said, we've had uh, messy auctions and I'm assuming there'll be further messy auctions in our future. So, so far, the official line is that we're just going to keep doing the QT for the foreseeable future, but um, I'm not sure how long that can hold, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a change in the spring. But, but again, not yet. They're not prepared to make the change yet, as far as I can tell. Well, is, do you get the sense that this is a liquidity issue, or do you get the sense that there is a profound uncertainty around the economic trajectory of a soft landing, a hard landing, or reacceleration that we could see in the economy? Oh, I, it's both. It's both. You know, I've just spent the last couple of weeks talking to a, a large number of investors, uh, you know, large and small, uh, private funds, hedge funds, banks, the whole sort of array. And, and the message I'm getting back from them is very clearly that there is still a huge spread of, of views. Um, people are, are all across the spectrum. There's no consensus as to where we're going with growth and inflation. You know, I'm talking to people who are adamant that inflation is dead forever and others who are adamant it's coming back by tea time. So there's a, there's a lot of disagreement within markets and that generates volatility, especially when you've got low liquidity. And I just don't see this going away. It's going to be with us for a while. Ian, it seems like uh, both Fed officials and market participants have been spooked by how wrong they've gotten the momentum that we've seen in the economy this year. Do you have an understanding of why people have gotten it so wrong? Oh, well, this is a gazillion dollar question for economists. I think there's a couple of things. Firstly, we all assumed that, that people would slow down the rate at which they were spending their savings that they built up during the pandemic. And so far, that just hasn't happened. It's carried on in pretty much a straight line. Now, whether it can carry on like that over the next year is a different question because it now looks as though most of the remaining savings is in the hands of higher income households who probably won't spend it so quickly. But certainly up till right now, the third quarter, uh, it's been pretty much a straight line run down. I don't think anyone expected that. And the second thing is, on the, um, on the investment side of the economy, we've seen a huge surge in capital spending triggered by the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And that also looks like it's flattening off now. But, you know, non-residential business investment in, in structures, those chips factories mostly, 23% annualized rate in the first yeah. half of the year. That, that was astonishing. So these, are, these have been pleasant surprises. But, um, you know, playing it forward into the, the next six months, I think there's much less chance of seeing that story repeating. With the San Francisco meetings coming up, Ian Shepardson with Pantheon's focus on China. Is the glass half economically full for President Xi in China? Does he have a legitimate 5% plus GDP economy? No, he doesn't. And he isn't going to have that for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, the problems in the property sector are still extremely deep. We're now in a in, in coming into starting our second year of deflation in, in PPI for manufactured goods. There's huge excess capacity there. Uh, they're not willing to do very large stimulus. It's, they're, they're sticking with this kind of targeted line and, and hoping they can kind of dampen the impact of the property uh, catastrophe. And um, we've now got consumer deflation as well, mostly food prices. But nonetheless, the signal there is, is of an economy where, where you know, growth hasn't reached any sort of uh, takeoff point. But um, it's unlikely to do that. You know, the, 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 the problems of China's economy run very deep and they go way beyond just the business cycle. They've got demographic problems with a shrinking population. And of course, they've got political problems as well because President Xi is scaring away capital. He's scaring away innovators. He's, he's, uh, he's scaring away inward investors. And all of these things at the margin are going to crimp and constrain China's economic growth for a very, very long time. So, you know, returning to that sort of 5% plus story, you know, you yeah. might get the occasional bounce, but it's going to be a big struggle. Ian, thanks for the update. Appreciate it. Ian Shepherdson of Pantheon Macroeconomics. Picture this, the year is 2023, and the world's largest bank is going around on a moped with a USB stick, settling treasury trades. Team coverage of ICPC, up next. If it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do so. We will continue to move carefully, however, allowing us to address both the risk of being misled by a few good months of data and the risk of over tightening. Shut that. No, we're not going to really? do it. I'm so all tempted morning. to do it. Oh, all morning. All morning. All morning. I wish we could, but we can't. I wish we could even play it, but we, we can't. can't. We, we could? We can't. <laughs> Chairman Powell. 
of the Federal Reserve on monetary policy going forward from here. Let's turn to the price action. We look like this this morning. Equities on the S&P 500 were negative by 0.1%. On the S&P, yields are higher in a bond market by two basis points on a 10-year. Nothing like the drama of yesterday, with a 30-year yield at one point yesterday higher by more than 20 basis points. Sloppy, $24 billion 30-year auction. The jargon, it tailed in English. The supply came with a much higher yield than where the market was trading right before that trading deadline. And Lisa, ultimately, we priced with a much higher yield, something like five basis points that tail yesterday, which is just phenomenally high. It's actually a record, according to some measurements, in terms of how much higher it traded immediately after the sale, which raises this question, why? Did people not show up? Was this some sort of hack that interrupted things? This is sort of what people pointed to. At the same time, a lot of people are saying it's all getting sloppy because people just don't have a compass of where the economy is going. At all. Zero idea and easily spooked given what's taken place over the last month in this bond market. So your 30-year at the moment is higher, but only by three basis points. The 30-year yield at the moment, 4.79. Bramo was talking about this ICBC hack, Tom. So ICBC, world's largest bank, has had to send a USB stick around Manhattan to clear Treasury trades off the back of this hack, which is just crazy to try and get your head around. I, I, I guess it could happen to anyone. And to give you an idea, their Wikipedia is one small paragraph. That's not the case for J.P. Morgan and other major banks, BNP, Perry, Bob Perry. There's a mystery to this quote unquote biggest bank in the world. Well, it is a Chinese bank. And there is this question around whether Chinese banks have invested as much as US banks in cybersecurity. We know that US banks know they've been targets. They have much more complicated types yeah. of uh, protective mechanisms. So here's the question. Does this mean that the ICBC was that much more susceptible or is this a new level of susceptibility for the banking system to some of these hacks? It's going to be interesting to see. And, and John, I, I think we've got to address this before we go to uh, Jennifer Serain. She's in London. This is not just a New York story. It's a global a story. joke of couriers running around Madison Avenue or Wall Street. Whatever. This is a global story. Banks yeah. have been worried about these issues for a long, long time, which is why they've been spending so much money, Tom, trying to prevent them from happening. It's just been interesting to see. We could really spend the whole hour on this. We don't. We have precious minutes with Jennifer Serain. She is in London reporting on this. And I really want to make clear, folks, this is an active reporting story for Bloomberg News. What is the response of London banks to this, Jennifer? What is the response of New York banks and indeed other state-owned enterprises in China? Yeah, I mean, I think the entire industry really takes not just this incident, but every cyber incident pretty seriously. Um, they've been investing billions in this uh, space. And I think every bank CEO, if you get them you know, off to the side at a conference and ask them what keeps you up at night, almost every single one of them will say cyber because it's, it's something that they can spend billions on and still you know, fall susceptible to. So I think the entire industry is obviously uh, watching very carefully how ICBC handles this, how it could impact markets. Um, but really, you know, the lesson here is um, this is a, a persistent and, and really scary right. risk for these banks. Can I assume that the decision making on this for this beleaguered large bank will be done in China, that all movements will be back to, to Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. So they've made clear in statements that they've put out that this is only affecting this one U.S. unit um, and that it hasn't yet affected other divisions, but they are apparently reaching out back to their home office to make sure that this doesn't spread from here um, and, and really trying to make sure that the, the effects are limited and contained to where it's already hit. Do we understand the mechanics of what actually gets getting interrupted here? That basically, my understanding is, counterparties closed off their connections with the U.S. unit of ICBC in order not to get infected with the virus, which raises this question of how ICBC delivers and closes some of the transactions that it's gotten orders on. Is that kind of what is going on here? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, it's interesting because that is generally the response we see from banks is as soon as they've identified a risk in the system, they try to close themselves off from that. Um, and so that was why you saw a lot of folks yesterday during the Treasury auction kind of citing this incident as why it might have been so sloppy, as you guys said earlier. Although it wouldn't affect the number of people, particularly those from China, that would be coming in to uh, look to buy those treasuries, right? Ostensibly, those transactions would still, at some point, come to the fore, even if it's on a USB stick, going to another bank. Do we have a sense of whether this actually has prevented Chinese buyers from coming in and transacting in US treasuries? 
Yeah, I think there were a lot of market participants that pretty quickly hit back on the idea that this was the sole reason behind yesterday's, um, you know, auction activity. And so I think we're still trying to get a sense of just, you know, how exactly those trades will ultimately be handled. Does this actually end up, you know, really fundamentally changing the way those trades are handled going forward? Um, so I think we're still kind of in the uh, information gathering stage on, on that one. Do we have a sense? Because uh, my understanding is that the shutdowns or interruptions really began Wednesday evening evening heading into Thursday's trading hours in New York. Do we have a sense of whether the volatility had been increased or whether there was any strange activity uh, affected in markets from a liquidity or purchasing standpoint ahead of that auction? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of market participants kind of pointing fingers, and um, so it's hard to kind of nail down. Um, it's sort of a chicken and an egg situation, if you will. You know, are people just pointing to this because they know it's a known entity out there, or right. is it some of the sentiment issues that we were talking about earlier? Jennifer, who are these guys? Who is this bot? Who is these people? Do, do we have any clue, or is it just a complete mystery? No, I think so. Our sources are telling us that this is the result of Lockbit, which is a pretty uh, well-known criminal gang with ties to Russia. They were actually the ones that were behind um, the ion trading hack that happened earlier this year in the UK. And so to your point earlier, you know, this is definitely not a U.S. issue or a China issue. This is a global issue that every single financial services firms, be it banks, be it, you know, market makers, be it technology firms that just underpin these different markets. Um, this is something that they're all really paying attention to and are all at risk of. Jennifer, just to wrap things up, when things like this happen, are other companies, other clients nervous about doing business with the banks that are under siege in a moment like this? I think certainly. I mean, I think there is something to the idea that you don't want to make a bad situation worse. And so we'll see how these banks kind of tread carefully today. But um, absolutely. I mean, a lot of these banks are, you know, getting together every month in different D.C. forums and, and doing a lot of information sharing around the risks that they're seeing. Um, but there's really not a good international standard setting body for that kind of activity. It's very much like country by country based. And so um, I'm sure that this will, you know, call into question whether or not that needs to be a more global effort. Jen, appreciate your time. As always, Jennifer Seren there of Bloomberg out of London this morning on the latest, just this crazy story that's developed in the last 24 hours that ICBC is basically under attack by what could be Lockbit, which is a criminal gang with ties no. to Russia. This is what is suspected of the attack at the moment, Tom, which has led them to struggle to settle, sh 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 settle trades and send around this USB stick around Manhattan. Well, I get the USB stick. Crazy. That's a theater right now, but I would defer to someone like Dan Tannenbaum. Who I think has really got some experience here. And I just, my question is do the budgets that we spend, the millions of dollars we're spending on cyber, are we just holding meetings to hold meetings or are we actually getting something done? To me, that's sort of the question this morning. Well, you can get something done, but it's sort of this, this chicken and egg, this sort of game that you've got to play. You've yeah. got to advance faster than the perpetrators advance their technology to potentially hack you. I'm just thinking that, you know, if I were advising some children who have any capacities whatsoever in cybersecurity, it might be a good industry to go into because it doesn't seem like it's going to be. You're speaking to your kids. I'm not speaking to anyone. <laughs> and they tuned saying. in this morning. That's what that's about. You know, listen up. <laughs> if you're looking for something to blame that weak treasury auction on, a lot of people feel inclined to blame it on this, Lisa. I think it's far too oh, okay. soon. We do not have the details I, I before agree. we can jump yeah. to that conclusion. It's out there. That this is because, of, come on. I mean, well, it's a bad treasure We don't auction. know. Because, oh, come on, our debt and deficit's out of control. We're spending a trillion dollars on interest payments? Okay, look, we have no clue, which is the reason why things have been bouncing around, because we don't know whether the economy is going to outperform or underperform. People completely got it wrong how much this economy would grow this year. It has spooked them because they completely uh, did not get how much inflation was going to tick up. We've gotten so many things wrong. How can you have any conviction to know where we're going in terms of benchmark rates? We've gotten things wrong all year. Like from All week to year. week, the narrative's just changing, flipping back again. And always wrong. Do you remember we'd seen the highs, it was all over, then yesterday happened, everyone's like, oh, no, it's back in the Treasury yeah. market, it's not gone away. Troy Esky's going to weigh in on this of FS Investments, that conversation coming up shortly. Going into the next hour, your equity market's shaping up as follows. Here are the scores. Equity futures on the S&P, negative 0.06% on the S&P 500. Yields bleeding just a little bit higher, up a single basis point on a 10-year, 463.79 on a 30-year yield after a big move high yesterday. High by two basis points this morning. Your 30 year, 478 from New York City. Good morning.
If you look at earnings, top line growth of revenue, we've started to see some weakness there. The equity market has become more expensive in absolute terms and more expensive relative to fixed income. Markets are a little bit more volatile right now than the underlying economy is. Ultimately, you will get to an earnings reset. We think that's part of next year's narrative. I think that you have to look for opportunities and things that have struggled as you go into 2024. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. The longest winning streak in two years is over. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Elisa Bramwitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P totally unchanged. Down and down hard yesterday. TK, pick your poison. Do you want to blame Powell? Or do you want to blame uh, that soft auction yesterday afternoon? I'm going to blame Paul. That's where I'm going to go. But I think the auction was of value. And as I've said all morning, Bramo was right. I was wrong on the auction. But you, you know what, John? I'm going to blame Paul and the idea that he pulled back. But, you know, this morning I got a VIX, John, of 15.32. And we were 21 a worried cup of coffee ago. So, you know, even with the one day pullback, it's remarkable where we are. I'm going to blame the auction. I think once again, spooking equity investors developments in bond markets. Lisa, to see that yield move higher by more than 20 basis points following that auction speaks to how nervous people still are about fixed income. And the lack of certainty around benchmark yields and where they're going to end up. I also think it's interesting, as you pointed out, bonds leading stocks once again. Stocks were kind of range bound and suddenly boom, down 0.8% on the heels of the I bond yields going up. I, bond yields are in control. I, and that is unusual. I do not agree that stocks are range bound. I think there's a lot of strategists really reassessing yesterday. on okay. this. The yesterday, OK, fine. But this, this move, this eight day move, was it an eight-day move? Eight-day winning streak. Eight-day winning yeah. streak. The character of it was somehow different. I'll let the strategists explain it uh, to me. I really want to know what John Golub thinks of this, you know, for an example over at UBS. Inspired by a bond market move, though, Tom, <clears throat> for yields to come yes, from 5% to a break Ab of 450 absolutely. on a 10-year maturity, and then Lisa further out the curve to be spooked again at the long end. And we said at the start of the week, that's where the test would be, not in the three-year further out along the curve on 10s and then 30s and it was that 30-year auction yesterday that really got things going in the wrong direction for the equity market bulls. And you could say it was Jay Powell but he basically said the same thing. You could say it's because people aren't necessarily coming to market because of hacks or other things. Very unclear. We don't know anything about that. What this highlights again is what Mohamed Alarian said on your show yesterday. The volatility is going to continue until we have more clear direction. I don't even understand what's going to give us that direction because even Fed Chair Jay Powell is saying we could get this head fake. We've gotten a head fake before. Transitory might have been a head fake. Well, as Mohammed said, the volatility continues even if the Fed is done. That's an important point. If you're just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity is almost totally unchanged on the S&P 500. We snapped that eight-day winning streak on the S&P, the longest winning streak in about two years on the S&P 500. We did that yesterday. Day nine would have been really rare. You'd have to go all the way back to 2004, and we just missed out. Yields are higher this morning by a single basis point. Lisa, the 10-year, 463.40. We talk a lot about Fed speak. We do get Fed speak today. We also get ECB speak, 7.30 a.m. ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking at an event in London. She arguably has a harder story to tell with some of the uh, declines in the economic momentum over there. <clears throat> also at that time, we get Lori Logan of the Dallas Fed. And at 9 a.m., we get Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed. Today, Next week, we're really going to be focused on this, and this is kind of going to be laying the groundwork. It's day two of discussions between Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and China Vice Premier He Li Feng in San Francisco. Biden and Xi Jinping are going to meet next week. Key issue for me, and I think that you touched on this well earlier, John, when you were saying, where is the balance of leverage? Is this going to be Xi Jinping trying to basically court the U.S. and some of those businesses to come back? Data point. Foreign direct investment. Dreadful into China. The meeting I'm actually more interested in is the meeting between the Chinese leader and business leaders in America. Can they really calm things down, Tom, and send a consistent, predictable message out of China okay. to allow that money right. to return? After the photo op and the Chinese takeout in San Francisco, what's going to be that message? I, 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 I'm lost. I don't know what the message yeah. is going to be. How do you create certainty of policy right. at a time to try to get foreign direct investment well, to turn positive after turning negative for the first time okay. on record? I'd be more strident than that sitting at the Mandarin Hotel in the central district of Hong Kong. Can you give us back the Hong Kong we knew? And the answer is they have no interest at all. In the meantime, well, how do people feel? That. And that's really what we're going to be watching. Feel? I feel great. Feel? I feel really glad that it's Friday. Have you told the University of Michigan 
how I feel. How you feel? I call him up. I say, hey, I'm, I have feelings. That would be Please scary. call me. I want to talk about my feelings. 10 a.m. People are going to be sharing their feelings. The University of Michigan <laughs> sentiment survey. The question is whether it's going to be uh, highlighting uh, this frustration with how high the bills are at grocery stores. Also, the five to 10 year inflation projection, which doesn't matter until it does, if it ticks up and sort of coheres with this volatility we're seeing in you know, I- bonds, maybe that will actually. You know, spook markets more. John, we got to get to Troy, but quickly sure. here. Uh, they're out with rents and rental change in New Jersey. Jersey City is as expensive as Manhattan. That's the new Miller Samuel report. I was just thinking about the small print in the press release that might come out later. We did accidentally call Lisa Abramovitz, which did skew the results <laughs> negatively. <Yeah. laughs> Troy Ganeski <laughs> joins us now, <laughs> Chief Market Strategist at FS Investments. Troy, wonderful to have you with us on the program. Let's start with fixed income. Did we confuse a bond market rally for bond market stability? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, humility is in order for any forecaster right now. But so much of this cycle, whether it's rates or equities, is there's market price action, and then there's narratives that follow that price action. And, you know, if you think of the way yields have gone higher this cycle, we've got to three and a quarter for a pico second rally back, then we got to four and a quarter for a nanosecond. And Tom, we really like this one. We got to five for a femtosecond and then rally back hard because the positioning was so bearish. And so we came back down hard, and then the narrative builds that, you know, we've reached the peak in yields. And then, of course, you right. either have a bad auction or you have Powell pushing back, and, you know, you have a 20 basis point gap higher. The geek from MIT is 10 to the minus 9 this morning. Troy Gayeski, let's go to the reality. Get out the calendar. Everybody's got to catch up. I saw, I'm going to give credit to Goldman Sachs, a chart on how hedge funds were out of the market before our eight day rally. You talk about the edge. You own the word alpha. How do we create alpha, not the year end, how do I create alpha out to the summer of 24? Well, so I think in a time like this, most of your positioning should be in what we refer to as Northwest Quadrant Strategies at the Fisher Frontier. We have lower vol, you're maturely accepting consistent returns. So, you know, there's a few areas we've been focused on heavily. You know, one would be prepayment sensitive RMBS because given where yields are today, there's going to be incredibly low refi activity right. really as far as I can see. So that's one area you're getting attractive carry. Spreads are relatively wide. We're not counting on spreads to tighten anytime soon until at least the Fed stops QT, which won't happen until recession. But if there is a harder landing and they do QE, then obviously spreads are going to come in right. significantly. So you get income plus price appreciation. Another area, Tom, non-speculative on the direction rates has been yield curve steepeners. You know, whether whether we get a bull steepener like we had earlier this year or a bear steepener uh, more recently, we're, we're fairly agnostic. And then for those that can tolerate less liquidity, you know, when you think of this environment as a private lender, um, you have the bank stepping back, you have higher for longer, and these are all floating rate loans. So, so in what we refer to as a dare to dream scenario, where we keep rates high and we can avoid recession, you're going to have very right. attractive income, right. and you're not going to have the hangover of a recession. So those are three areas, Tom. To translate the jargon frenzy you just heard, Gajewski's trying to capture the coupon right now. Troy, tell me about the equity markets and technology uh, stocks. They have been on fire recently. Does the fire continue? Well, you know, when you look at an asset allocation, there, there's certainly no reason not to own growth, right? I mean, I, I never understand these arguments why you shouldn't own growth. You should own international. You should own Japan. You should own EM. I mean, this is a winner-take-all economy, both in the U.S. and globally. And, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, that's really concentrated in the top five, ten names in the S&P. So the, the issue we've had with big cap tech, particularly over the last several weeks, or mega cap tech, is – you know, are the valuations reasonable given realistic earnings going forward? Obviously, earnings uh, are not going to be nearly as strong as they were the past five, seven years. And we look at those multiples in the event of another round of multiple compression driven by Fed QT and money supply contraction, you're more than likely going to have some price declines. Um, but as far as a secular holding, we don't know why you wouldn't have some in your portfolio. And then you look for other things to complement that in a, in a very uh, volatile market environment. Can you give us a window, Troy, into the debates that you have at FS Investments about your year-ahead outlook for 2024? Oh, yeah. So the debates are obviously a lot of fun. But, you know, when you think of the economy, you know, we've always been in the higher for longer camp. That being said, even we're surprised at how resilient the economy has been. Um, the, the, what we're trying to fine-tune, and, and we don't claim to have a crystal ball, of course, is 
what's the probability of recession in the next 12 to 18 months? Is it 50 percent, 60 percent? It's arguably higher than 40, probably no higher than 60. And what's the environment where the Fed can thread the needle? What's the probability of that, whether it's 40 percent or 30 or even 50? Because of the increased business fixed investment and construction spending, because state and local governments can spend, because the housing market at least isn't a dramatic drag on GDP. And then in turn, what does that mean for inflation forecasts? So, you know, from a macro standpoint, it, it's trying with, again, humility to understand in which scenarios do certain trade expressions generate attractive returns and, and in which other scenarios do you get better upside or better convexity? a phrase that I know Tom loves well. Troy, given the range of potential outcomes, are longer term treasuries virtually uninvestable unless yields are so high to compensate for all of those scenarios? Well, well so that gets back to the, the scenario analysis. We, we, we have cautioned everyone in fixed income that again, every time market yields have popped up, just be aware before it's said and done, before we have that next recession, you could really get hammered with a bear steepener. And that's obviously what happened up until recently. You clearly have better uh, risk reward in fixed income today than a year ago or two years ago. Um, but in, until we have that recessionary outcome or until at least markets truly price it in, not fictitiously price it in, but truly price it in, you know, all you're going to earn is your yield and you're going to have tremendous amounts of volatility. So. We don't think it's time yet to extend duration uh, cavalierly, um, but you more than likely want to think about that and understand that in a recessionary scenario, you don't have as much upside as you've had historically because, you know, like where's the 10 you're going to go? Front end goes to three, 10 year goes to three and a quarter, three and a half. So you have upside, but not like the GFC or the Eurozone crisis or the pandemic or 2002. But if we stay in this dare to dream scenario and the Fed can thread the needle, you're going to get no price upside. You're going to have still a relatively low yield compared to when we had inflation this high in the past. And you could get some adverse market price action again, like we did yesterday. A repeat of yesterday is not what many people want right now. Troy, thank you, sir. It's got to catch up, buddy, as always. Troy Gajewski of FS Investments following a steep day of losses on the S&P 500 yesterday, following a big sell-off in the bond market once again. If you are just joining us, <coughs> welcome to the program. The scores look like this. The S&P positive by just 0.01%. For once, the bond market unchanged, 462.41 on a 10-year. <coughs> to Troy's point, the shape of the curve leaks. So we've been talking about this. If you want to get long-end debt, long-dated debt away in this market at the moment, do you need a steeper curve? Especially uh, if you end up believing that the Fed is going to effectuate a soft landing. If that's the case, does that mean that yields are going to have to come down on the front end, that basically they're going to have to cut rates, not in response to pain, but proactively in response to lower inflation, and that you will get higher yields in the long end, but that those front end rates have to be pinned much lower than the three or three and a half percent that Troy Geiske was talking about. This Federal Reserve, Tom, does not want that conversation right now, based on comments we had from Fed Chair Jay Powell just yesterday. Yeah, well, OK, but he just set the meter record. I think he came out with his handlers and they said, OK, we better readjust the market. To me, what's important, John, is not the comment yesterday. I think we all sort of knew it was coming. What's the next comment? And particularly, what's the comment after next week's fireworks, CPI and retail sales? Wait for the data. Wait for point. the data. And CPI that next comment's week. the one in terms of an eight day rally and the shock we've all been through. That's when it really matters. Going to the research on the south side on Wall Street at the <clears> moment, there just seems to be this consensus that the labor market is no longer a reason to be hawkish. Neil Dutta, Rem Mack has really led that effort. Yes. But with you, ultimately, the focus is going to go back to just CPI top. What does it look like? Morgan Stanley well, think we get back. Get back, Tom. Get back to the twos. OK, no big deal. No problem. $76 West Texas Intermediate is distant from the inflation fears of weeks ago. This hour, fantastic conversation coming up. Christian Horner, about 30 minutes away of Oracle Red Bull Racing. That conversation coming up shortly from New York City. <coughs> Good morning. I've made one of the toughest decisions of my life and decided that I will not be running for re-election to the United States Senate. But what I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle. Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia announcing his retirement from the Senate in a video 
posted on X in the last 24 hours. TK, greeted by surprise. <clears throat> Were you surprised by this? I wasn't surprised uh, by this at all. I wasn't surprised by it all as an amateur, but I'm listening to the pro, Anne-Marie Horton, in the last hour who made clear to me there was no surprise here and that he was a significant number of points behind in polling against said Republicans in a very Republican state. So what's the question, 2024 or 2028? Is that essentially what's going on? And then is this basically a Mitt Romney, I, Joe Manchin ticket? Because this has sort of been the speculation on the street for a little bit. To, to those younger, show me a third party effort that's worked. That's it's, it's just from Perot on, it's just been a challenge. It's just a struggle in this system. I've got great respect, John, in the United Kingdom for the liberal Democrats. I mean, at least, you know, there's, I don't, I don't even know what a, the, the difference is between the three parties, but the answer is, <laughs> hey, at least you got three parties. I've never met a bigger fan of the UK system than you. What's a liberal Democrat? That's Where do nice. they fit in? Somewhere in between. Tom Keane. In between. Somewhere the in between. Well, that's what Joe Manchin, seriously, that's if, what Joe Manchin's looking for. He's looking for the in between. It's something in between. Yeah. On certain issues. The middle. Let's get to the latest polls, shall we? Please. Bloomberg News Morning Consult. <clears throat> Swing state voters see U.S.-Mexico border security as a greater priority than the foreign policy crises that are increasingly dominating the president's agenda. Here are the numbers. About three times as many voters, Tom, said immigration is their top issue yeah. in the 2024 presidential election. We need perspective on this right now, folks. When Wendy Benjaminson joins us with all sorts of poll experience. Wendy, just you're the right person at the right time here. When we go in the voting booth after Labor Day, after the October dash, when we go in the first Tuesday of November, what do we care about? To me, foreign policy never is what we care about. Am I right? Absolutely right. Tom, uh, you know, foreign policy never wins elections. But right now, uh, the Biden administration is absolutely consumed with the Israel Hamas war, as well as fighting with Congress to get more funding for Ukraine, while Republicans are saying, <coughs> fine, but let's fund the border. Well, it turns out that voters in the swing states, the seven swing states that Biden needs if he wants to win reelection, right. are saying, now, a majority of them did say we want more funding for Israel and we want more funding for Ukraine. But two thirds of them said we want funding for the border and to secure the U.S.-Mexico border and to do something about immigration. So the administration is really going to have to, um, you know, perhaps pivot and come up with a way to address right. those critical voters concerns. Wendy, I have the clearest memory of the celebration of the George H.W. Bush primary win and them dashing up the road at Killington, Vermont, certain they were going to win. The bandwagon was underway. And then it was the economy stupid. Is this going to be about the economy or is this the culture war election? I think it is going to be about the economy if the candidates listen to the voters. Now, while they did prioritize border security, 41 percent of these swing state voters say the economy is their top issue. And so if they focus on school boards and, um, you know, other sort of culture war issues like that, it will lose. The one sort of issue that falls under the culture war umbrella that is clearly winning elections, as we saw earlier this week, is abortion rights. A majority of Americans want <coughs> abortion rights, and the Republican Party lost a couple of elections this week because they focused on restricting abortion. Wendy, do we have a sense of whether there are more swing voters than there have been in the past? I think there probably are because, as, as my colleague Josh Green wrote this week, along with Nancy Cook, nobody wants Biden and Trump. So, uh, you know, we call these the double hater voters. They don't want Biden to be on the ballot and they don't want Donald Trump to be on the ballot, which is why a guy like Robert F. Kennedy in our poll is um, gaining double digit support. So, uh, yes, I think, you know, disenchanted, disillusioned, all those words are, are what describe the electorate right now, a year out. Tom was saying earlier that typically independent uh, running mates don't actually gain any traction in general elections, that the independent candidate for presidents have always just taken votes from one party or another. Is there a sense, Wendy, as Joe Manchin does his van life around the country, is there a sense that this time is different, that there is enough of a critical mass of swing voters that an independent candidate could actually gain traction? <clears throat> 
I, I think that could be true because of the double haters I described. The trouble is that a guy like Joe Manchin with a D behind his name and sort of the character he is will tend to pull more votes from Joe Biden than he will from Donald Trump. That would damage Biden and probably split enough Democratic votes for for Trump to win. Now, our Robert F. Kennedy is more interesting because our poll showed that right now he is pulling equally from both Trump and Biden voters. So he, unlike Ross Perot, as Tom mentioned earlier, would be sort of a non-starter. But I think Manchin could have an effect if he decides to run for president. Right. I think he might be too old. He would be 80 by the time 2028 arrived. So I don't think 2028 wow. is in the cards. But um, uh, but he could he could uh, uh, you know turn it around for Trump. Wendy Benjamin, tell me about the governor of Kentucky. To me, beneath the radar of the Tuesday elections was a 45 year old John, a 45 year old in American politics. Wow, a mere <laughs> infant, the infant from Kentucky. This guy has political heritage. Maybe he's a Democrat that climbs on board. What do they do with Bashar of Kentucky? Well, he was extremely popular, and you're absolutely right. This is Mitch McConnell's state, a you know a former coal state, very Republican. Um, but it is a state that also has enshrined abortion rights after the Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. And Andy Bashir is a very popular Democratic governor, able to win in a red state. So Democrats might be looking at him in 2028 or 2032 or whatever, because he is as you said, an infant in American politics these days. And, um, you know, it looks like he'll have a nice career ahead of him. Wendy, thank you. Might last another 40, 50 years. Who knows? Wendy Benjaminson <laughs> of Bloomberg, thank you. Appreciate your time down in Washington. Some amazing stats in this poll, Tom. Just to share a little bit more colour on this. Gloomy signal for the current president. Swing state voters said they prefer his likely rival. Right. Key foreign policy issues. So poll respondents said they trusted Donald Trump to navigate the Israel-Hamas war more than Biden, 44 yeah. to 31, and preferred the former president more than the Russia-Ukraine war, too, by an 11-point margin. And it's not only swing states to talk to our expert on this. Greg Giroux, folks, is just encyclopedic. Lisa, on the five Ohios, and Giroux blocks them out, and they're pretty much in equal part five. And he says, look, you look at central Ohio, which is as purple as you get, and that's going to be the swing of the swing state. One unique aspect of these two conflicts is how much they've split inside each party as well. And so I wonder how much that's informing some of the poll results, because Democrats are not in agreement if you go around and try to get some sort of sense of what people want to see happen, whether it's with the Hamas-Israel war or whether it's in Ukraine. Same among Republicans. So maybe it's just that there's enough of a critical mass of people who support the former President Trump at a time when everyone else is kind of splintering. I mean, really, this is, this is such a unique moment in both parties in terms of lack of agreement. I couldn't agree. The two fringes of each party. I think the Republican issue is around the Ukraine, the Ukraine war here, Lisa. And then for the Democrats, they can't get consensus on how to support Israel at all, given the extreme fringe on the left side of that party. And you could hear that from President Biden when he came out uh, overnight and said Israel is running out of time, or this at least was how the New York Times reported it, that he said, you know, Israel has a certain amount of headway before it expands the conflict and gets a lot of people uh, angered and creates more hardline people on the other side. Is this because they actually think so, or is this because of the pressure internally to come out and try to, uh, to, to end this more quickly? Some of the latest numbers from our Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, which came out in the last 24 hours, more on that still ahead in the next hour with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. We'll catch up with AMH again in about 60 minutes' time. <coughs> if you're just joining us, here's the price action. Equities positive by close to 0.1% on the S&P 500, trying to bounce back from yesterday's losses. In the bond market, a rally returns. We're down two basis points on a 10-year, 460.43. On the two-year yesterday, we had the first loss of the week of the month in the equity market on the S&P 500. We had the first close on a two-year above 5% of the month so far as well, Tom. I went to cash late yesterday. <laughs> Wait, you? no, I was already in cash, excuse me. How's that working out? It was good. Yeah, it's like I missed the rally. I'm sure. Uh, like big time. From New York, good morning. <clears throat>
attempted to win the week on a brighter note in the equity market on the S&P was shaping up as follows. We look a little something like this. We're positive by 0.1%. We're actually down on the week on the S&P 500, even with that decent run, eight days of gains going into Thursday. But yesterday's loss took us back below that line hmm, of the centre. Yeah. yeah, the Nasdaq just about unchanged on the session. Responsible for all of this is the bond market, of course. Just check it out, the two-year, 10-year, 30-year, the 10-year at the moment back down by two or three basis points, 459.64. On a 30-year, we're down about four basis points to 471.97. It's the move yesterday at the long end of the curve, Lisa, that just spooked everybody. 30-year auction, really, really sloppy. Boom, yield surging higher again. So the two-year auction earlier this week, uh, or is it three-year auction? Uh, and then the 10-year auction. You don't know, both, I don't I mean, know. honestly, it was, it was, it was a three-year three three auction. Three -year. I, I realized that I misspoke there. Um, we're looking right now at a situation where meh auctions are raging successes and completely dreadful auctions, just plain bad, as some have been yeah, saying, well, are really disruptive to this feeling of stability that has been a fiction every time people try to coalesce around it. The first thing I looked at this morning, Morning, leases in your world, I looked at the difference in yield between the 10 year and the 30 year, the 10s, 30s spread, and it didn't give me a lot of information. They're going up and down in tandem, right? <laughs> I think you're not getting a lot of information from the volatility at all. I think that that's actually perfectly said <clears throat> for all of the things that we're trying to rationalize and give narratives to this week, last week, the week before, et cetera. You two agreed on something. We agreed. I'm in shock. Let's you know, turn to foreign exchange. This is Kathy Jones <laughs> I can't here. believe it. <laughs> no it's jarring. We wouldn't do this for right Liz and Saunders. On the euro, 106.83. <laughs> We're positive by 0.1%. Up until today, the dollar having a four-day run. Dollar index stronger for four consecutive days, attempting to close out with the strongest week going back to July. Just trimming some of those gains at the moment on the euro, 106.83. Under surveillance this morning, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the world's largest bank, launching a thorough investigation after being hacked in a ransomware attack. A criminal gang known as Lockbit with ties to Russia, suspected of orchestrating the attack, which forced the bank to send trades through a courier with a USB stick, Lisa, across Manhattan. Still trying to work out what's going on here. And ultimately, is there any connection between this and the story we were talking about in the bond market yesterday afternoon? And how many computers can really accept USB uh, cords to get the information, right? I mean, there are all of these real questions at a time when everyone's kind of mobile and it's all in the ether. Uh, this, to me, raises questions, A, about the security of banks and this question around should we move to a more central clearing model for treasuries or something that is less bifurcated in all of these different entities. But the second question is, what does it say about everyone jumping to the conspiracy theory to explain a failed auction, not a failed auction, but a pretty, uh, a pretty poorly received one. That, to me, highlights the lack of certainty around what's really behind all the moves. When you have to take comfort from a hack, because you don't really know what's going on elsewhere. I think it speaks to how tricky the moment is. Well said. It's like, you know, you're in the market. <clears throat> Please tell me it's the hack that messed up the bond market and not something more sinister, which is kind of where we're at. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announcing he will not be seeking re-election when his term ends in January of 2025. In a statement, Manchin hinting a potential presidential run as a third party candidate saying, quote, what I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle and bring Americans, Tom, back together. In a polarized America, we have to go back and understand most of his elections have been very close in a very Republican state. Back to the special election on the death of, of Robert Byrd, uh, Senator Byrd of, of West Virginia. And that was, I believe, 53 percent he won. I mean, it is a state where he's got to look at a very tough election. So there's a question about whether he's just avoiding <clears throat> losing the election or another close run. Uh, I'll let him answer that. Or this other, which is the implication there, or this question around, is he really looking into an independent bid and is this time different where an independent candidate could gain traction in a way that has not been possible over the recent decades? And that still remains a question. Let's finish on this story. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up her two-day meeting with China's Vice Premier in San Francisco today. The meeting <coughs> reported to be focusing on the increased use of security measures in commercial relations. It's happening ahead of the much-anticipated meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping at next week's APEX summit, the two leaders expected to discuss foreign investment tariffs and greater transparency going forward. On foreign investment specifically, Lisa, I think that's a big, big topic of conversation for next week, particularly given the data we've seen more recently. Yeah, in the past uh, couple of days, the foreign direct investment falling, declining into China for the first time in, in history. Uh, this to me really highlights the concern <coughs> for Xi Jinping and possibly his motivation for coming here. 
but how does he give certainty? You asked this question last hour. How does he create certainty at a time where the rules have flipped and flopped and ideology I, has ruled over economic policy? It's going to be really difficult. I, I, I go to John's point earlier. The body language of this American executive meeting with yeah. him is going to be far more interesting. I, how can they get anything done? I mean, just as one example, China's bumping up boats against the Philippine Coast Guard in the South China Sea or take it up north to the tensions of Taiwan. I, I just... The idea that we're going to get substance here, or even the theater that we saw with President Trump on other visits, I just don't see You know see what it. corporate America wants, Tom? They want stable <clears throat> and predictable policies sure. to make long-term yeah. investments. And in some parts of the world, they're not getting it. And let's see if we can provide some kind of soothing words to corporate America to provide it. I, yeah. I don't think we're going to get that in just a week. That's going to be an ongoing effort. A headline from Morocco, John, just out. This I heard on stage in Marrakesh. Lagarde, if kept long enough, rates will take us to 2%. Is she singing from the Bundesbank hymnal? Get back to 2% inflation. Adamant. That's the goal. How much damage do you do in between yeah. to the European economy? The backdrop for European growth right now. Right. Very different to what we're seeing take place in America. Will we get back to 2% yield? That'll be a great story. I believe that's price up and yield down, if I get it right. Kathy Jones now gives perspective, chief fixed income strategist in your kitchen this weekend of what to do. She's with Charles Schwab. I am absolutely fascinated with an always open question to you and Lizanne Saunders. What are people at Schwab doing with their fixed income money? Yeah, so what we see among sort of the majority of the clients is they've been staying very short in duration. They're starting to move out. They're starting to get some confidence that they can move a little bit further out the curve. They're staying in high quality. Treasury's very, very popular along with CDs, um, not really dipping their toes into low quality. But, you know, at these yields, muni bonds, Investment grade corporates, treasuries are looking attractive and they're getting a little bit more confident about stretching out duration. The pros are worried about liquidity, whatever that means in the bond market. Should our viewers and listeners be worried about liquidity and full faith and credit, simple to buy duration bonds? You know, I, I don't think for the average investor, the liquidity issue is going to be a big one. Um, I think for traders, I, I think for people like us navigating the markets for our clients, it's, it's an issue. But I also don't think it's a critical issue right now in the market. You are the one person who I was most looking forward to speaking to today. I really want to get your understanding of what happened with the failed auction yesterday and whether you give any credence whatsoever to this idea that the hack of ICBC, of the U.S. unit of ICBC, had something to do with how poor it went off. You know, I, I don't really know uh, for sure. Uh, it is an open question because we haven't had something like this happen before. Um, it seemed like the when issued market was okay uh, going into it. There were a lot of questions because we've had such a big rally at the long end, you know, who would show up after rates dropped so much. So there's some questions about that. And then you start to get the Powell comments and then you got the hack, whatever that may have had to do with it. Um, so I think it's kind of a constellation of things. But we'd had such a big rally going into it after the 10-year went well and the three-year went well. I think that had something to do with people stepping back. What sort of signifies to you that we're actually getting stability in longer-term bond yields enough to get some conviction, to have some sort of trade that can last more than a couple days? Yeah, we don't have it yet. Um, especially the further out the curve you go. You go beyond 10 years, you really don't have it. Even the 10-year, I mean, look at the volatility we've had recently, up 50 basis points, down 50 basis points. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think the market needs conviction that the Fed is really done and that the, it, you know, the hold has some sort of um, time frame that you can anticipate. And then we start to get that stability. We thought we had it, and, and then Powell spoke, and we don't have it. How much does this really have to do, though, with the Fed and its policy at a time when people are citing fiscal policy, where people are citing uh, potential inflation, where people are citing just simply where are the buyers going to come from at a time of changing policy overseas? Yeah, we haven't. So I, I tend to think it really has to do with three things that always influence the, the trend in rates what the Fed is doing, because you have to discount that. There's no way you can get around the Fed, no matter how hard you try. Um, what inflation is doing, uh, which is tending to recede, 
and then how the economy is performing. And then you get into these other things like supply and who's buying, you know, in China, Japan. <coughs> but actually, the foreign flows have been pretty steady despite all this chatter. We've had the foreign flows hold pretty steady. The, the reserves are pretty steady. So I'm less worried about that. Fiscal policy, obviously, it's a concern. But is it a concern mm -hmm. today versus yesterday versus a week ago? That's a hard argument to make. One year out, am I clipping coupons or can I actually invest for total return after a three-year nightmare? I think you can get some total return. It's not that hard when you've got a coupon this large to get a positive total return. I'm going to clip the coupon and I'm going to get some capital gain out 12 months. I think 12 months from now, yeah. We have fair value, say, in tens, right around four, four and a quarter. And so if we get there, if we get even close to there, um, you're going to have a positive return. Going into next week when we get CPI, how volatile is the market and how potentially massive could some of the moves be on the heels of either an upside or downside surprise? Yeah, we're. I don't think we're done with the volatility, Lisa. <laughs> I think it's here to stay for a while until we get either that, you know, confidence about where the Fed is and where it's going, which I don't think the Fed really wants to give us too much confidence, right? I think they want to keep the market a little bit off, off center. Or we start to get those labor market numbers that are just so soft that the market says, oh, okay, now the Fed really has to start easing. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Andrew Honhorst of City just <coughs> published. He's had a hawkish view of this Federal Reserve through the whole cycle, much more hawkish than most of the street. And this is the kind of thing that he's writing now. Just listen to the shift in language here. The Fed is on hold. The bar to hike will likely not be surmounted even by the upcoming three months of stronger core inflation data they expect. Lisa, that's a massive, massive turnabout from City and Andrew Honhorst, who are basically saying this bar for another hike here is much higher than you think. Given the fact that they were talking about another hike possibly this month and, uh, you know, that even then the momentum might be difficult for the Fed to take on, this raises this question. Does that mean the long end yields are going to come down or does that mean they could potentially go up further if the actual economic growth continues to be stronger than expected and inflation does too and the Fed remains on hold? And Goldman thinks that growth can continue. If you're just joining us, welcome. Equities right now just pushing a little bit higher on the S&P 500 up by 0.2%. Yields are a little bit lower by a couple of basis points, 459.83, anticipating the inflation data of next week. And Cathy, I'm with you, the labour market data. I've been asking this question all week, Cathy. I'd love your thoughts on it. The labour market data, the Federal Reserve seemingly, in the views of a lot of people on the street at the moment, no longer view labour market data as a reason to be hawkish. At what point, and you alluded to it, at what point is it a reason to be bearish on risk assets, given that it starts to suggest something a lot worse? Yeah, I think the um, I think we're kind of on the cusp of that possibility because what you're seeing is real income growth slow down when you look at the labor market data. So we don't really know where Nehru is anymore. That used to be a really popular thing back in the day, um, but and I think the Fed knows they don't know what that is. But if you start to see, you know, the unemployment rate rise, the hours work <coughs> continue to decline, the average hourly earnings continue to slow. You're talking about then income growth really starting to slow down significantly, and that's going to have the impact on the economy. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the constellation of numbers coming out of that that's really important. Is this soft landing talk a moment or the destination? It's the moment right now, Bramo, and if you get to four and a half, pushing 5% on unemployment, I think we might be having a different conversation, right? Especially if you look at historical precedent and an increase of a half a percentage point in unemployment over six months has never happened. So it's a journey. A material it's a journey. <laughs> Close the door before you it's go on your journey. <laughs> Close the door. Close the yeah. door. He Something just wants like to that. curse on there. Yeah, I, he's I'm just, dying, he's just, yeah, I know. <laughs> the more authentic me, if we were able to curse. You going to Las there. Vegas? I wish I was. It's cheaper to go to Vegas now. It's cheaper to go than hotel the, prices. You and I looked at road trip and it was ridiculous. We can maybe go to F1. We're going to chat with Christian Horner, team principal of Oracle Red Bull Racing, as we anticipate a much anticipated race in Las Vegas. That conversation's next. The beautiful thing is, is that we have a lot of different Grand Prix still, and um, I think it would be very boring if they're all the same, right? And yes, I am very aware that, you know, um, we shouldn't go to all the, let's say, the commercial 
places, but I think also Las Vegas gives you a new, a unique opportunity. And then time will tell, you know, if it's the right way to go or not. What a great season it's been for that guy right there. Absolutely Giant. dominant. Red Bull Racing's Max Verstappen <clears throat> speaking to us earlier in the summer, Tom. Looking forward to a race which is now just around the corner. It's still there. And John, would you say that F1 is still large in moving off the huge success of Netflix? Without a doubt. Big breakthrough. Yeah. Big breakthrough. Although there are some indications that maybe next week's race right. in Vegas wasn't as popular as they hoped yeah. for it to be. Given some indication that ticket prices have come down, Tom, hotel prices come down as well. We're going to get to this conversation, John, quickly here. I loved Brazil. It was like an old race? course up oh, and down. Classic loved track. it, loved classic it, loved track. it. I'm pleased you enjoyed that, Tom. Let's do this right now, and this is going to be fascinating. A first time in Las Vegas, and what you need to know is in the vicinity of Tuesday, it will be 73 degrees in Las Vegas. That doesn't matter if you run a race at 10 p.m. at night Pacific time, 1 a.m. Eastern time, 6 a.m. in the morning in Banbury, England, and the rest of it. Uh, Christian Horner is team principal and CEO of Oracle Red Bull Racing. And John, I'm sorry, it's about tires. That's what the experts tell us. Christian, it could well be about tires. Good morning to you, sir, and thank you for being with us. I think we have to start by saying congratulations on an absolutely dominant season for you and the team. We'll spend some time talking about that in just a moment. Let's go where Tom went. Just approaching a new track you haven't had time with, you haven't raced on before, and with track temperatures that could be very, very low. Christian, what's the approach for you and the team going into an event like that one? Take a jacket. Is it that simple? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I, I was watching Max on the simulator yesterday driving around the circuit. It looks a great track. I mean, it's going to be super fast. Um, there's going to be a lot of overtaking opportunities, and the tyres, it could be like driving on ice. Um, you know, which just adds another dimension. So particularly on a road course, on a street circuit, that can test the drivers and the team to the absolute maximum. Christian, when it comes to stuff like qualifying then, how do you prepare, prepare to put that fast lap in that you try to do to get that quality in? How, how do you do that? What do you do? Set up with three laps before you go for the qualifying lap? What do you do? Well, that's all going to come out of when we run on Friday for the first time. Uh, sorry, on Thursday for the first time, we're going to be um, learning you know, what it takes to get these Pirelli tyres uh, up to temperature. And is it going to be multiple laps in qualifying rather than a single lap? So it could be really interesting to see how that's, uh, that's going to play out. There's going to be a lot of data to look at. And, uh, uh, yeah, the simulators are going to be working flat out on certainly Thursday evening. Christian, any worries that this could just be a bit of a disaster could end up in chaos? Well, look, street races are always dramatic. You know, we've seen that in Singapore, we've seen it in Azerbaijan, and of course, Monte Carlo. Um, and this one promises to be a, a big one. I think it's going to be one of the biggest viewed events in the sporting calendar uh, this year. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident it's going to be a, you know, a great success. Christian Horner, I was appalled by the accident very early in the Brazil race. Your Perez was very much involved in that. How do you make the start of the races safer? I don't think you can. I mean, you've got cars that will accelerate from 0 to 100 miles an hour in less than two seconds. And you've got 20 very competitive drivers all going you know, for, uh, to try and make position into that first turn. So inevitably, sometimes there is going to be contact. But the safety of the cars, the safety of the circuits has increased dramatically. And, uh, uh, you know, thankfully, we're seeing um, you know, drivers walking away from what sometimes look like very nasty accidents. Christian, you said 20 competitive drivers arguably there's 19 and then there's one guy on his own out in the front I want to talk about that the domination of Max Verstappen he's still so young Christian he's taken over Alan Prost he's basically on course to take over Vettel maybe even in the next couple of races in terms of race wins when you go back over the legends of this sport that you've been so close to over the years Fanjo, Senna, Schumacher even more recently Hamilton where does Max rank for you what separates him from the rest? Well, of course, it's always incredibly difficult to compare drivers from different generations. And, um, but what I think is safe to say with what Max has achieved in a short period of time, uh, with now three world championships, 50, uh, 51 or 52 Grand Prix victories, it's, it's an incredible, incredible record. And uh, I think that, that you know, he can now be spoken about in the same, in the same sentence, in the same category as some of the greatest drivers that the sport has ever seen. How far do you think he can go, Christian? 
Well, I think he, he you know, he, he's still so young. He's still uh, evolving as a driver, and particularly as he gains more experience. So, it, and a lot depends on the equipment that we can give him. But I think he can achieve a lot more. He's motivated. He's hungry, and uh, yeah, he's he just loves his racing. You can see that he's not interested in anything else other than just going racing. He's been dominant. Your whole team has been absolutely dominant. I remember Ferrari being accused of making a sport boring in the Schumacher years. Do you take it as a compliment when you hear those kind of accusations thrown at your team? Well, it means that we're doing our job um, and that we're, that we're winning. But the one thing that's guaranteed in this sport is that nothing stands still. And I think with stable regulations, we can already see teams improving uh, behind us. And I think the next year it's going to converge and we're mm-hmm. in for you know, a much more uh, tight championship next year. And, and also, you know, 25 before another reset with new regulations for 2026. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm expecting a much, much tougher year in, in 2024. Right. Christian, to that point, and, you know, I have my autosport at home. John Farrell made me get it. I try to read it and I try to understand it. A lot of your uh, brethren are really trying to fix their cars now for next year. What do you do when you're as strong as you've been about tweaking the platform into the next season? Do you leave it alone? Do you leave the car the same as Verstappen has known this year? Or do you actually try to make improvements? Well, you're always looking to improve because you can guarantee our our competitors are going to be going to be improving. They will be copying some of the philosophy uh, you know, of our car, that's undoubted. We're already seeing that starting to happen. And we just got to keep trying to move the goalposts, try, try, you know, to try and keep uh, developing and in, improving ourselves. And so, of course, you know, for the last few months, the factory have been very, very focused on that. But, of course, you start to get into diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's going to be tough to improve the RB20 next year significantly from where RB19 has been this year. Take us into the pit, because to some of us, you know, I watch Netflix and I think I'm an expert. I'm not. Christian Horner, take us into the pit stop where you're, you know, you're 2.3 seconds, 2.8 seconds. How do you train for that excellence versus the other teams? Well, it's the same, same as in any discipline. It's all about uh, practice. It's about a- analysis. It's about the small incremental things, just where the driver stops. You know, if he's two inches too long, then uh, that will affect the timing of the stop. So it's, it's rehearsal, it's practice, it's positioning the right people in the right roles, it's having the right attitude uh, and the determination to continually, uh, to continually improve and, of course, be consistent. Christian, let's talk about next year. You've got two drivers, both under contract. There is a question mark over one of them, Checo. The drivers you have in the cars in the coming weekends. Are they going to be the same two next year? Well, the only people that keep putting the, pre- the question mark are you guys. I mean, we keep repeating that Checo's going to be our driver, uh, you know, next year. And, uh, you know, he's had a tough, uh, a, a tough six weeks, but he started to refine his form. I thought the race that he drove in in Sao Paulo was very strong. His race in Austin was strong. And, uh, you know, he's finding his form again. He's second in the world championship. He's uh, you know, over 30 points ahead of uh, Lewis Hamilton with two races to go. So, you know, let's see what he can do over these next couple of races. But he uh, will be our driver alongside Max uh, in uh, 2024. As a team, are you expecting Max to help him secure that second position, or does he have to do this on his own? No, I don't think I don't think he'll need the help from Max. To be honest with you, I think he he just needs to finish either ahead or just behind Lewis this weekend to secure that that second position I think you know we're treating these remaining races as cup finals and that's that's how we've you know operated since winning the championship a few races ago in Qatar and each race holds huge importance to us and to race in Vegas uh yeah it's going to be a phenomenal thing and uh we're going to be chasing uh you know our 20th victory of the year there for sure and uh it's just very nice of them to have put a race on to celebrate my 50th birthday I think uh, (laughs) particularly in last week Kristen you asked for it Happy birthday. It's fantastic it's to catch up with you, sir. Congratulations yeah. on an absolutely dominant season. It's just been phenomenal to see play out all year. And thank you also, Christian, to you and the team for being a fantastic partner with this programme over the last few months as well. Christian Horner there, team principal and CEO of Oracle Red Bull Racing. TK, absolutely dominant. I wasn't like into Las Vegas in at 10 p.m. Pacific time, 1 a.m. our time, 
with the danger of moving sideways on ice, as he said, this is not a normal race. Yes, the tyres can't get the grip, yeah. yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. Returning to markets, equities right now, just about positive. You need to be comfortable with the fact that if the market comes in 10 or 15%, that you're a buyer of the dips. The quiet in the market is a reflection of stability in the multiple and stability in profits. Given the setup into year end, we can expect some kind of Santa Claus rally. It's going to be slower, but I don't think we're about to go into global recession. The problem with soft landing and recession might look the same for a very short period of time. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. And angst yesterday, Bramo out front in a 30-year <laughs> auction. Forget about it. Future's up nine. Green on the screen. I'm going to get a 14 print on the VIX. That was a one-day upset, John. Are you saying that's a one-day upset? I'm looking at the screen right now. That's what it says. Of that. We have to talk about that one-day upset. The one-two punch to sentiment in the last 24 hours. 1 p.m., sloppy auction. 2 p.m., Chairman Powell. Let's push <clears throat> Chairman Powell to one side and focus on that auction. Yeah, he's behind the door. This equity market rally of the previous eight days, watch it, inspired by this move in the bond market. Yields down from 5% to a break of 450. Spooked yesterday by a long-end auction, 30-year bond, Tom, coming to market, price much, much higher in yield yeah. than where the market was trading. Well, that spooked a lot of people. Legitimate news yesterday. We had one, two, I mean, a hat trick, of not gloom, but a hat trick of angst out there. We've looked at the Bloomberg reporting on the Chinese bank. But Lisa, help me here. Which of these, the 30-year auction that you nailed or the Powell comments moved the market. To me, it was the Powell comments. Well, it was a, a confluence of events. It was an auction that made people feel uneasy <clears throat> about what the drivers were of the volatility, of where the buyers were and at what price point. And then there was a Fed chair, Jay Powell, who came out with a different tone than people had expected, at least based on last week's press conference. Here's the issue, and I go back to what Kathy Jones is talking about. Volatility is here to stay. That's what she said, her words. If that's the case, what do stocks do? Is this sort of an acceptable level of volatility in treasuries where stocks can start to ignore them or are treasuries going to be whipsawing uh, stock uh, action for the foreseeable future? I'm going to go to the foreseeable future of Wednesday. I'm sorry. It's a CPI report, more data, more retail sales next week. A dearth of economic data this week, John, maybe had a lot to do with an eight-day love fest. Add this to the calendar. Wednesday, November 15th, President Biden, President Xi, set yeah. to meet on the sidelines of the APEC summit. Just confirmed in San Francisco, team leaders who have not spoken, Tom, since the G20 summit of last year. On the agenda, AI, fentanyl, military communications, on the agenda for the President of the United States. Now, let's go back to our morning <coughs> consult poll together with Bloomberg that we released in the last 24 hours on swing states in America for the 2024 election. Tom, just 1% said US-China relations were their most important right. issue. It's an easy one percent in our poll. Completely take the point. I think Anne Marie Horton has been wonderful on this. Wendy Benjaminson, uh, I thought, gave perspective. It's domestic issues, and yet that poll confronts the geopolitics of the moment. And Lisa, it wasn't one thing like China. It's five, six, seven things that are a November distraction. Yeah, and there's a question of what crossover there is from national security to some of these other <laughs> issues, right? I mean, there's a lot of intertwining of these issues when you talk about border security and other things. I will say, notable, that President Biden is doubling down on the international, even as some of the polling right. is saying, hey, people are focused on the domestic more. I'm going to get this in, John, on the data check, because no one else is talking about it. Three, four days in a row, even with UA to speaking, Euro Yen tells me challenges on YCC in Japan. I'll be looking Sunday evening. You'll be you know, you'll be, you know, out. What am I doing? doing what am I doing? <laughs> what, what, come on. What am I doing you're, Sunday you're, evening? You're going to be, you know, you're going to be out socializing in Manhattan. If you have a Bloomberg terminal, advanced. you can buy on me on Sunday afternoon and you'll see a green dot. <laughs> and you'll see a red dot next to you. No doubt about it. Equities on the S&P 500 look like this. On the S&P, we look like this. Up. We're positive 0.2%. over. <laughs> Yields lower <laughs> by a couple of basis points. 460, Tom. The rally's <clears> back. You can forget yesterday. That easy? That was very good. I like that. I mean, we look. At, but oil, I've got to mention it quickly. It come out seventy-six dollars a barrel. That's an underpinning to the market of this talk of enduring disinflation. Also, an associated fear as well, though, Tom. You get a break of eighty again on Brent. 
get a break of 450 again on a 10 year and we'll have that conversation about slower growth Global slower. into next year yeah. the ambigu- get away from the ambiguities into the weekend uh, senior vice president of ambiguity at Merrill and Bank of America private bank Joe Quinlan joins us right now perfect voice uh, to speak to as we recalibrate into the end of the year Joe Quinlan what are you doing in asset allocation let's start with cash I've got it in the money market fund making 8% Am I overcashed right now? Not really, Tom. I just got back from the Midwest talking to a lot of our clients. They're happy to be in cash because they're worried about the election. They're worried about the geopolitics. But from our perspective, take the cash, but be ready to lean into equities. Get your shopping list ready to rebalance over the first half, maybe the first quarter of 2024. So. Cash is right. okay now, but long-term returns come from equities. Which sector are you going to lean into? Let's start large. Is it growth or value that will drive us out 24 months? Well, the sector specifics, really energy, healthcare. We still like technology on any pullback. You have to own technology. It should be a core holding. We're long defense, cybersecurity, just the geopolitics, the reality of the world. So whether it's, it's a mix of growth and value, but large cap leaders in these various sectors. Joe, just on cybersecurity, that ICB story has got a ton of attention in the last day or so, sending a USB stick around Manhattan to clear Treasury trades after this attack by Lockbit, suspected to be Lockbit anywhere, criminal gang with ties to Russia. Joe, how much money has been spent on that area on Wall Street for financials and companies all across the country? I mean, John, when you add it up, it's billions of dollars, billions of dollars with big banks. We've got to move it into the regional banks, healthcare, you name it, hospitals. This is unfortunately, it's a growth industry, cybersecurity. It's it's something we don't talk about. You can see the images from the Middle East. It's right in front of us. But the cybersecurity, it's invisible, but it's very active and just as dangerous in terms of the overall level of economic activity. So. That, unfortunately, is a growth industry as well across various sectors. Are they the growth stories that you want to be attached to, though, the growth stories that are divorced from the cycle? Any other growth stories? I mean, we, we like the hard assets. We like the infrastructure story. We've seen a little bit of pullback, re- renewable spending. But I think, you know, we're on the cusp of a kind of a manufacturing construction build out that's going to extend well into 25 and 26. So we're telling clients, these big industrial names, right? It's too early to go cyclical the industrials, but on a pullback or any type of type of day where you can get a, a good company at a cheaper level of price, do it. And so that's what we're seeing here. So, Joe, how much of your time do you spend talking to clients and saying exactly what you just said, that long-term returns come from equities, regardless of the day-to-day fluctuations in bonds? Just ignore that. It is becoming noise. You know, Lisa, quite a bit because they're worried about the Middle East. They're worried about the election. I'm amazed how many clients want to talk about the election now. So we're going to be exhausted a year out. So so we're having that conversation. But really, you know, since 1945 to 2022, the annual average compound returns of the S&P 500 are over 11 percent because we've got a great private sector. So I know everyone loves cash at 5 percent plus. But when you look at the long-term returns of U.S. equities, the S&P 500, it's double. So that's the point we keep pounding home to investors. So So when you have these pullbacks, you step in and you buy quality. The pullbacks have come on the heels of yields going higher. And this, I think, has been uh, part of what's been spooking a lot of people is that, yes, those 11 percent compounded annual returns since 1945 came on the heels of a pretty massive bond market rally that fueled a lot of the gains, at least over the past 40 years. And suddenly we might be setting up for a very different scenario. Does that matter to you? How much do you say ultimately it doesn't matter because the private sector will remain strong? A little bit of both. I mean, the private sector is going to be the private sector. But remember, Lisa, the, the, when we had z- zero interest rates, uh, we, we had very low interest rates. We, we had a 10-year yield you know, below 1%. That was the anomaly. We're going back to normalization. So if we get a 10-year yield at 4%, 4.5% in that range, we get a mortgage, 30-year mortgage rate back at, say, 65 like 6%. That's normalization. So we're we're normalizing mm-hmm. at a healthier level, actually, in terms of cost of capital, which is going to help set the foundation for more growth, more earnings, more upside for U.S. equities. Joe, you know the ballet. It's November, and I'm going to quote unquote window dress out to the end of the year. Tell me about the Quinlan window dressing. How far behind on big tech is institutional Wall Street? 
Uh, you know, many have missed it. You know, we, we saw last year tech get crushed. So a lot of people, like I said, I'm not touching this. And so we're, we've saw them miss the rally in, in general, not just tech, but in general. So, but I think people are realizing that a core holding for portfolios is technology, the digital economy, the cybersecurity risk, the AI revolution. You add it all up, everything leads to technology. And we are, we, the United States, the big seven, whatever, and other companies, we're the leaders. So you want to have that as a core portfolio, a holding. So US over the rest of the world for you, Joe? Still, John, unfortunately, I mean, we're looking at flows coming in from overseas. Everyone wants to own the US. Everyone wants to come to the US. So it's still that type of world. And we, we don't want to be so US centric, but all, lo- all roads when it comes to innovation, productivity, and leading global growth, it's the United States. You're not lonely on that point, Joe. Thank you, sir. Joe Quinn in there of Maryland Bank of America Private Bank. The latest on the international front, I think China would like some of those flows. <clears throat> Let's put it that way. Getting confirmation just moments ago that Biden and G set to meet November 15th on the sidelines of the APEC summit. Lisa, the first conversation between the two leaders so far this year, widely anticipated, but simultaneously played down by this White House as it's going to deliver any kind of breakthrough anytime soon. I think a lot of people have their doubts. Expectations are incredibly low, and yet people have been framing this as just having a discussion for the first time between these two leaders in at least a year is a good sign of softening ties. And I got to say, it comes at a time where there's a lot of speculation that China is behind uh, an increasingly tight ring (laughs) with Iran and Russia and China, all the names that are kind of put together around some of the geopolitics, that if there is a dialogue between Xi Jinping And President Biden, a lot of people are saying just that alone might be a good sign. I wonder if it's a meeting of complexity or simplicity. I don't have a strong opinion on that. It'll be fascinating to see if they stay on first order niceties or they actually dig into details. I could tell you what's on the agenda, according to the officials who brief reporters on condition of anonymity. On the agenda, the military realm, issues involving artificial intelligence, fentanyl, and detained Americans in China. The latest report in here at Bloomberg. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equities on the S&P 500 positive by 0.3%. Yields are a little bit lower by three basis points, 459.44. It's a quiet end to the week, potentially. Lisa, potentially going into the weekend. I love watching pre-market trading activity and then just seeing how different it is at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It completely changes uh, on a dime. It very well can and it has. So to me, the conviction here really has to come from either long term or else short term following certain momentum. I mean, honestly, (coughs) to me, it was so interesting. You have Kathy Jones saying that bond volatility is here to stay. And you have Joe Quinlan say, ignore it all that basically just buy stocks, bonds are noise, and that stocks are going to keep doing well because that's what they've had for the past, you know, 60 years. And if in doubt, Tom, just blame the hack. (laughs) Yeah, well, the the hack is there. And uh, to me, it's going to be fascinating based on the Bloomberg reporting, and it's not just out of New York. John, get out the calendar. It is November 10, I believe a week from now, we're going to enjoy a government shutdown. (laughs) <laughs> no one's talking we about have it. The seven day countdown. Normally, it's like I said, we need a countdown clock to the government shutdown. And usually, this is the number one topic. And now it's buried behind seven stories. Because we've had this story so many times, Tom. Yeah. Totally desensitized to it. But yeah, I'm with you. It's creeping you know, up on it's us. It's creeping up. The headlines out here the Biden administration shutdown planning call was held on Thursday. Oh, was it? Yeah, you know. You know, it's like it's a conference call. It's There's a good like job. 400 Anne-Marie. people on it. AMH is coming up next, so we can catch She's on the Anne-Marie. call. She's on the call, yeah. Yeah. Talking about what they can do, what they can get ready for ahead of that shutdown. She's not, just in case anyone ever believes. Some of the stuff TK's talking about. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P 500. Positive here by 0.3%. Live from New York. Good morning. The United States has no desire to decouple from China. A full separation of our economies would be economically disastrous for both of our countries and for the world. We seek a healthy economic relationship with China that benefits both countries over time. 
Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking in a meeting with the Chinese Vice Premier in San Francisco. This is President Biden is set to meet with China's <coughs> President Xi Jinping on November 15th. Tom, we don't want to decouple. We want to diversify. Decouple's become this word that no one wants uh. to use anymore. Can't say that. I don't even think they want to say de-risk. They want to say things like diversify. The, lang diversify. the language of all this, and I'm going to go to Catherine Mann now over at the Bank of England or with Michael Rosenberg here at Bloomberg, really codified the dysfunction of the relationship. And the key phrase they use is not decouple, but our codependency. And maybe the question in San Francisco is, how much does China need our commercial business. To me, that, oh, with the executives meeting, I mean, that's the background. We'll go back to the foreign direct investment stat, the data that came out yeah, more recently. Yeah, stunning. Negative. Yeah. So we've been talking about this charm offensive that China ultimately officials need to go on a bit of a charm offensive here and to provide US leaders with some clarity. Because, Tom, if you're making a 10 year, 15 year investment <clears throat> in a country, you want some form of predictable, predictable. Visibility. Yeah, we call that Hong Kong. And, Something you know, stable. I, I, I will always, uh, speaking with Lord Patton, the day of the end of Hong Kong, he's in tears on the, uh, in, the, in the interview. And it's just simple as that. Look at the facts and the observation that we've seen. And that's where you get this true bipartisan approach to this important meeting out of Washington. It looks like both sides want to calm things down. To, <clears throat> let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. I, so I, I'd be surprised if we got anything but that in the next week or well, so, we but we'll see, we'll see. We'll have to see. Joining us now, Anne-Marie Horton, our Bloomberg Washington uh, correspondent. I guess we can tilt towards a meeting with China. Anne-Marie, to link it into the poll today, and I mentioned this earlier, but let's do it with China with this important meeting on the 15th. Does anybody really care about foreign policy or is that the province of people like you? Well, the president of the United States certainly does, and it means he has to use a lot of capital on it. I mean, these are things potentially are not top of mind for the American people, but the president is also dealing with issues that he necessarily didn't run on, issues yeah. that he has to deal with. Obviously, two massive conflicts happening right now in the world, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what's going on in the conflict between Israel and Hamas. We should note when you look at China... It is not just this concern about economics or potentially whether or not what the future holds for China <clears throat> and are they going to invade Taiwan. But the fact of the matter is the United States and China are on opposite ends of both of these conflicts. So you see right. a real power struggle right, right now. And I think that is why the global community, even if Americans aren't paying attention to it, leaders around the world want to see these two countries. Even right. though Jonathan said earlier, <clears throat> there really is no deliverable, but they want to see the dialogue between President Joe Biden right. and Xi Jinping. Emory, I believe the president of China will fly back and the government won't be shut down two days later. Is the president of the United States going to fly across the country to a November 17th shutdown? Well, I guess that's why Xi Jinping has his central planning. Uh, well, listen, <clears throat> President Biden should be back in time for this deadline. Remember, the government shuts down 12.01 a.m. Saturday, November 18th morning. So they have all of next week to figure it out. Potentially, we're going to get a text before this weekend or at least by uh, before the end of the weekend is up about what Speaker Mike Johnson plans to do when it comes to keeping the government open. Is it going to be a clean CR? He's floated potentially a CR, a continuing resolution to keep the government funded till next January, January 15th or April 15th, or there's going to be this laddered approach, which some lawmakers I talk to are struggling to even understand what that means, but basically having multiple fiscal cliffs, keeping some agencies open and having different due dates. But we'll see how the Republicans plan in the House of Representatives to get this through. Speaker Johnson said he does not want to shut down, but remember, this is what costs Speaker Kevin McCarthy his job. Uh Anne-Marie, I want to stick on what we're looking at internationally with respect to the Xi Jinping-President Biden meeting. You were talking about how some of the conflicts Ukraine, as well as the Hamas-Israel war, uh, have heightened awareness of an increasing closeness with China and Russia and Iran. How realistic, how close are some of these ties becoming as these conflicts escalate? Well, I think these ties are very close. I mean, look at the drones that Russia is using in Ukraine. These are Shahad drones coming from Iran. This is something that the administration wanted to put a lot of pressure to stop. China and Xi Jinping has a lot of power in these conflicts. He can really put his thumb on the scale and put some weight and pressure on President Putin and Iran to honestly 
um, hold back and and to and to stop some of this. But China, for the most part, has said some of the right things in public, not all. Remember, it took them days. I don't even know if they fully come out and said it as explicitly to condemn Hamas's horrific massacre on October 7th. But Iran, of, uh, China, of course, is getting a lot of cheap fossil fuels at the moment. Right now, they're getting tons of crude from Iran, and they're getting, basically, Russia, someone said to me, has become a penal colony for Xi Jinping and his fossil fuels. And they're hoarding all of these fossil fuels from Russia and Iran. So China has a lot of uh, stakes in this, as does the United States. One thing we should look forward to in this meeting, which well, I'll, I'll be going and covering this. Remember, they haven't spoken since the last G20 in Bali. This time we're going to San Francisco. Is potent, this military to military engagement. That was absolutely cut off when Speaker Nancy Pelosi made that trip to Taiwan in August of 2022. My question is, who is Lloyd Austin's counterpart at this moment? China has yet to, to name someone after Li Shang Fu was ousted. Do we have a sense, Anne-Marie, of how much the geopolitics really is going to dominate? Yes, there are these other issues at play, but how much some of these escalating conflicts and the tit-for-tat that you're talking about in South Asia Sea really will be at the crux of what they're dealing with? Well, I think it's going to be a slew of issues, right? Fentanyl is going to come up. I was looking at some of the fentanyl data and the deaths of the United States, and everyone, especially Republicans, have been pointing to China as this number one influence when it comes to fentanyl in the United States. They have increased every year over the past decade, and I believe it was last year that it's the most we've seen tripling the prior three years. So this is a huge concern, and that's showing up in our poll. Right. More Americans want to see aid to the U.S. southern border than, say, potentially aid going to Ukraine. So fentanyl, obviously economic coercion, the military to military engagement and what is going on right now in these two power struggles in Ukraine and in Israel. These will definitely be top of the agenda. Hey, Mesh, thank you. The latest down in Washington, D.C. with Anne-Marie mm. on a meeting between the two leaders of the United States and China, respectively, next week. Let's sit on China. What wasn't? for the Chinese economy this year. We were meant to have this reopening boom. It didn't happen. Take a look at the luxury players now, year to date. Richemont's getting hammered today. It's down by about 5 to 6 percent at the moment. It's off session lows, but ultimately it's down double digits on the year, year to date. Earlier on in spring, we were talking about a boom for luxury, European luxury. LVMH is now up year to date, Tom, by one percentage point. One, we have basically wiped out all of the gains for the year on LVMH TK. This luxury story has not materialized the way no. people thought it would in 2023. And I'd take it broader. I mean, this has a China angle to it, clearly, but I would take it broader into retail sales that we see next week. It's 70 percent of the economy. We all know that statistic. But, you know, I, I, I'm going to just drag luxury down to the broader middle class and even down to the basics of, of, of big box retailing. You're, it's a mystery. That's all there is to it. And it's more of a mystery in China than it is in the U.S. because in the U.S. the savings and the uh, fiscal impulse has kept people spending at a, past, pay, at a pace that has surprised everyone. In China, the reluctance to spend even when people have <clears throat> money, I think, has surprised people. They have savings, but they don't want to spend it because there isn't the confidence in the economy in the same kind of way. And there, I think and people have underestimated that to a significant and degree. And someone like China Beige Book would say it is about just that their confidence in the only conduit they have, which is the property sector, separate, John, from what Richemont does on the Bund in Shanghai. Yeah, Richemont's had a difficult quarter, eh? Looking out. Softer demand for watches, Cartier. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm at Cartier on a daily basis. I mean, they have Cartier. How's Cartier doing? You were spotted coming out of a certain store. They've with, got Cartier. With an, orange, with an orange bag. Different, different brand. Can I ask? I've actually got the photo, you know, <laughs> someone sent it to me. <laughs> Can I ask a stupid question? What is it with watches? I mean, the idea that somebody wants to wear $30,000 on their wrist as a I, status symbol. Oh, as like, a status symbol, like, that's a very different conversation. Yeah. So just having... But if you're someone who really admires the workmanship, the craftsmanship yeah, that goes sure. into something like that. But that's like why that, Swatch that's, exists. That's I mean, I got a Swatch and it works. I mean, you know, it's all there is to it. There's no way you've <laughs> ever had a Swatch. Just no way. From New York. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Bloomberg. 
Bloomberg surveillance off of the tragedy of yesterday, we look at futures up 13, Dow futures up 106, VIX threatening a 14 level. We go to Lisa Bramowitz for team coverage here. <laughs> what happened to the gloom yesterday, Lisa? Well, you know, blinking, maybe it'll come back. I mean, this is basically the issue is that people are trying to fumble around different levels. I keep going back to Joe Quinlan saying it's getting kind of exhausting. Just ignore it and just stick with stocks. And how many but, people are going to coalesce around that? Or is it just the good feeling of that banner that we just talked to Anne Marie Horton about? The president of the United States will meet with the president of China. That's germane to me. So I you mean, think that that's giving people confidence to go into risk assets? It takes the fear, it takes one level of fear away. I'm not saying it's confidence that's overselling it, but I, it's a good tape this morning as well. Jonathan Farrell in preparation for, I don't know, what's the show? He's doing a real yield? Or <laughs> He's doing, doing like, the open. He's working all <laughs> afternoon, I think. And we got Dana, Dana Peterson coming up here. Again, the future's up 12. But right now, and this is important, down at the, um, in honor of Ken Rogoff, the Jacques Polak annual research conference at the IMF, Michael McKee was holding the door for Jerome Powell uh, yesterday. We're not going to go there. <laughs> off, off we have Mike, all morning, but, Mike. In, in your years and years of doing this, and Mike, you know, we're not going to go through the litany of Michael McKee stories. It's the biggest risk for all these people, that dreaded off Oh, Mike, well, Mike. Every, everybody in public life you know, it goes through that at one point or another, and you want to make sure you don't say it. The most yeah. famous of all was Ronald Reagan when he was joking around and said, we begin bombing in five minutes. And, <laughs> and that went out over a live mic. And <laughs> that caused some yeah. consternation around the world. Let's talk about the consternation we saw yesterday in our data dependency to next week's inflation report. Does next week's inflation report cure all if it shows a disinflationary tendency? It probably makes uh, things a little less volatile for a while, put it that way. Uh, it's kind of hard to know with everything going on in the world where you want to end up. And I noticed that uh, several bond market strategists are saying the one thing you don't want is to go long into the weekend because nobody knows what will happen over the weekend. Uh, but um, the basically Powell tried to push back to where he was the day before the Fed meeting or right after the Fed statement came out when everybody was taking that as uh, relatively <clears throat> hawkish and then his press conference, as so often happens, turned out to be more dovish for people uh, and they started pricing in rate cuts. Uh, but uh, whether he uh, is going to be effective at holding that, it's hard to say when you look at where the bond yields are today. Okay, we joke all the time. But in reality, how often do Fed officials look at the bond market and then calibrate their discussion points around what they see there? Well, very rarely. Uh, as long as trades aren't failing, they realize that markets go up and markets go down and there isn't always logic to what's happening. And uh, so they're not going to get too overly concerned. <clears throat> they look at the Fed funds futures and they know those can change on a dime. By next Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning, we get uh, CPI and then you know, who knows where yields could be. So you, as, as the Fed uh, looks at this stuff, it, it's like, we can't control that. We can't do anything about it. We were talking about Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup coming out earlier today, and he was one of the people saying earlier this year he expected the Fed to hike one more time. Now he's not. And now he's saying the bar to hike again is infinitely high at, at a time when we do see signs of a slowdown, particularly in the employment data. Do you agree with that? Do you think, all things being equal, the Fed is essentially done unless something catastrophic happens uh, or incredible, and that they are more willing to cut rates? No. Uh, that, last, that last phrase there would be where I would disagree. Uh, I think the idea of infinite is not necessarily true. Uh, I think the bar is higher for a, another rate increase, but it is not as high as the bar for a rate cut at this point. The Fed accepts the idea that as interest rates uh, stay high and inflation goes down, in theory, if inflation goes down, that real rates rise. Right. And they may want to back off a little bit uh, to keep uh, essentially the same amount of tightness in the markets, but they don't know when that's going to happen because they do anticipate, and I think Jay Powell said this yesterday, that yeah. the last percentage point <laughs> from three to two is going to be really hard, and therefore they need to keep the pressure on. Mm. So they're not going to put any kind of date on it at this point, and they don't right. want the markets doing that, so they're staying away right. from the rate cut. 
Clark. One, qu one quick question in the zeitgeist this weekend is the Sam rule. This is Claudia Sam, who's been an immense supporter of, of, of what we've done. She's trying to game recession. She's been extremely clear about what her data says within her equation. Are we anywhere near a recession based on the Sam rule or any other McKee measurement? Not based on the Sam rule at this point. Uh, if interest, if uh, unemployment continues to go up, you could see that. Uh, but right now, as she points out, you know, <clears throat> you have to go basically 50 basis points higher and we're only 30 basis points right. higher. So you've got uh, some room between now and then. And she also thinks because this has been such an unusual recovery that maybe the rule <clears throat> won't apply this time. Got you. Change the rules as you look at the rule. Change the rules, yes. Sounds like English Premier League soccer. Michael McKee, thank you so much. With a brief into an important week next week on inflation and on retail sales. And for that, a brief wonderfully posi positioned, I'll say, at the conference board, their chief economist, Dana Peterson. Dana, how is Consumer America? How are we into the retail sales report next week? Well, the interesting thing is that consumers continue to complain about life. Uh, they're very concerned about inflation, particularly high food and energy prices. They're saying that interest rates are too high. It's impacting their ability to buy homes. And they're also more concerned about geopolitics and the state of Washington. So with all that, consumers are saying they're concerned about their future finances and incomes and even job availability. I love that we're going to have a, a segment about feelings ahead of the feeling survey that we get out, the University of Michigan sentiment survey that we get out at 10 a.m. How closely related are people's feelings with their doings, with what they actually are buying? Well, the interesting thing is that when we look at current conditions, Consumers are still purchasing things, but they're putting it on their credit cards. Just earlier this week, we received data from the New York Fed that shows that credit card use is still up, it's rising, and also so are delinquencies. And delinquencies for credit cards, auto loans, and even other loans are now slightly above the 2019 level. So consumers have run out of that excess savings, especially at the lower end of the income spectrum, and they're shifting to very expensive debt to finance their purchases. Is there some correlation historically between a downturn in sentiment and a recession and the labor market and some of these other indicators that are uh, more closely followed by people at the Fed and beyond? Well, if you look at the Consumer Confidence Index, it almost never tells you what's going to happen with consumption in the GDP NIPA data. But it does give you a sense of how <laughs> consumers are feeling. And if they start worrying about the future, especially jobs and business conditions, it oftentimes presages something negative. Now, we do have a new indicator in our consumer confidence survey, and we asked them outright, do you expect a recession at some point over the next 12 months? Now, those expectations have eased, but it's still 69% of consumers say that there is going to be a recession. Well, let me go right there, Dana. I think that's really, really valid. In all the work you did, all the economic history you did at Wesleyan, which leads on economic history, is there any, any ability to pick and call a recession? Well, we do have our leading indicator, and it, it's usually pretty good at signaling recessions. Now, it's been <laughs> negative for 18 months, and it's been signaling recession for quite some time. But the thing is that it doesn't have much in the way of services. And we know services spending has been very strong and that's a product of the shifting in demand post pandemic, uh, less mm. on goods, more on services. And so it may not be telling the entire story. So we're definitely right. watching other measures of services. Absolutely brilliant. And the basic idea here, folks, and this is important and a question to Dana Peterson, is that okay, if it's a services America and it's a kind of services America, which we really don't understand it, can we actually utilize Friedman from, come on, Dana, Friedman could be your great grandfather. Can, can, can we utilize Friedman from 1950, whatever, on long and variable lags? Can we actually ha have that conceit? Well, I think long and variable lags are very relevant. When we look at monetary policy, it hits the economy at different points in time. So higher interest rates have definitely subdued the housing market. And I think when we look at the GDP data from the third quarter, businesses are, are getting bitten by the higher cost of capital. Now, the next thing is consumers. And certainly in our survey, as I said, they are complaining about higher interest rates. And certainly that's going to start affecting consumers when they have to start paying those elevated credit bills um, at those very high interest rates. How political are people's <clears throat> feelings? 
Well, we don't have and we don't ask them, like, how do you feel, you know, politically, but we do ask them what they're worried about. And more of them are saying they're concerned about geopolitics and also what's going on in Washington. Um, but we, we, we really should look to what happens in elections to get a good sense of how consumers feel. And we just had one this past week. Well, the reason why I ask this is because there have been a number of surveys showing big divides in the sentiment among different voters based on specific issues and how they're being portrayed in certain circles. I'm just wondering whether that's become a more polarizing factor in some of these sentiment surveys in recent years or whether it's always been that way. Well, when you look at some of our, well, one of our competitors, they actually do ask people about uh, how they feel by political party. And it's usually the case that whatever party's in power, those folks, folks usually feel better um, than uh, the other party if they're depending upon their political affiliation. So it's not really a great measure because if your guy's in the, in the White House, then you feel good about it. Uh, Dana, thank you so much. Dana Peterson, terrific brief there on the data that we look for next week. She is with the conference uh, board. I, I think things are so topsy-turvy right now, and I mentioned this. We're seven days out from a government shutdown. Nobody cares. I don't care what Emory Horton says. And the idea that, yeah, we have huge data next week, and nobody's really talking about it. I love that you say that Anne-Marie was trying to make us care about the government shutdown when you basically were trying to make her care about it and give us some information about it because well, we don't really theater, pay attention uh, you know, to it. OMG, yeah. shut down. <laughs> well, exactly. And the reason why uh, people aren't paying attention is because it seems to happen every other month. But you're right. I think the CPI data is going to be a really big deal. And the really retail big sales, deal. Especially yeah. because of the volatility and the lack of certainty around the trajectory going forward. To me, the amount of jumpiness that you get in bond yields and then commensurately right. in risk assets is just keeping everybody a little bit on their toes. And we, I, we, I think we've had a dearth, I'm going to say, of holiday shopping microanalysis. Not that I've ever paid much uh, <laughs> attention to it. Okay. Uh, Dow up 114 points. Market's surging here. It's a Bramo rally. The VIX 15.02, trying to give us a 14 uh, print. Speaking of 14, the S&P up 14 points. Standard & Poor's 500 up three-tenths of a percent. When you talk about the holiday shopping season, do you shop <clears throat> right before Thanksgiving? Is that your thing? Do you, have you ever waited in line you look before, a store, you look <laughs> before a store opens on the morning after Thanksgiving? Here's the history. In the old days of a more graceful Wall Street, you would work Christmas Eve take somebody to lunch or late breakfast, whatever, Christmas Eve, and then you'd begin your shopping. You'd begin your shopping 11 p.m., Christmas 11 a.m. Christmas Eve, you just go in and find something for someone, not a lot of planning. Uh -huh. Is that, is that the that. Tom Keen prescription or the was, more graceful no, but prescription I think a lot of people Street. used to do that before this retail madness that we all invented. Why is it that we're here today? Because there are a lot of places that are shut down the day before Veterans Day. And I well, am trying to understand what the bond is, market and people, holidays I, I, and the I, stock I, I market gave, holidays. I had the honor of giving a speech at the New York Stock Exchange about this. The oddities of when we trade stocks is, is, is comical. Like, we're off Good Friday, but we're not off Choose Your Major Jewish Holiday. And I find that just completely non-modern. I think that's almost from a 19th century. And you have it here with Veterans Day, which for the people that served, I did not. But for the people that served, I'm sorry, this is an important day to remember World War I. And there will be a moment of silence, I believe, at 920. Yeah. Uh, it, there, well, I believe uh, later on this morning. Uh, in honor of Veterans Day, right. it is an important holiday. It just, <clears throat> to me, the, the sort of confusion around what right. is... Sort of well, there's 35 the days left in the year, and I've got 40 days of vacation, so see ya. That's what, <laughs> that's that's what the time you said see ya two days. Coming up, my last interview <laughs> of the year forever, Sonia Meskin, BNY Mellon. We'll do that here in a moment. Markets Rally features up 15 Bloomberg surveillance from New York. The Fed is moving off center stage. The Fed is going to have much less of an influence on where rates go from here. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that the volatility is going to go away. Why is the Fed done? Because they're going to get the air cover from headline inflation coming down very rapidly. So even though core inflation is going to be sluggish, they're going to get air cover 
from headline inflation. That was Mohamed El Arian, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Queens College Cambridge president speaking with John Farrow yesterday at a time when many people are expecting the volatility in treasuries to continue regardless of what the Fed does. John's off preparing for that 9 a.m. hour. Tom Keane here, Lisa Abramowitz as we uh, head toward the opening bell with a lift, a Tom Keane strength to the S&P futures of four tenths of a percent it's, it's as surging. yields continue. We got the VIX is uh, under 15. Lower. Come on. 14.95. <laughs> That's because of the 30-year bond auction. <laughs> okay. So this is the question. Does it stick or not? I do, before we want to get to our next wonderful guest, I do want to just give you a sense of one share moving uh, this morning, Diageo, in addition to Richemont. We were talking about Richemont earlier, uh, the Switch Watch maker. But Diageo, which is the uh, parent company to Johnny Walker and Smirnoff oh, Vodka, I didn't know that. Uh, those shares plunging the most on record after cutting the outlook uh, with the uh, head of the company saying, there are materially weaker performances in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is a huge, huge deal. There's any number of ways of looking at this. And if you go to LVMH, the singular disappointment for LVMH was, of all things, cognac sales in America. And in the fancy look, I don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert at this, but in the fancy liquor part of the luxury business, I think crater is the option, uh, the operative word right now. Well, do you think that this is something Nestiagio. specific to the liquor market? Or is it something that, you know, people are moving more to craft or to uh, specialty things, which Maybe. was a trend? Or do you think that this is actually indicative of luxury <clears throat> demand? I mean, that to me is one of the key questions with the two-pronged spirits and watches. I mean, I'm going to make this up. I'm going to deal with our wonderful people in London who are expert at this. But the bottom line uh, is I think there was a pandemic acquisition. And yeah, Lisa, maybe you, you don't down a bottle of cognac in one night. I just don't think that's the way it works. So, you know, they bought in and, you know, there's there's a long and variable lag here. Although, as you look at the cognac ar sales. Arguably, that long and variable lag during the pandemic was less. Let's move on right Let's now. On. <laughs> so joining us now is Sonia Meskin, head of U.S. Macro at BNY Mellon Investment Management, as we head into a potentially volatile week uh, next week keyed off with some of that retail spending, do we have a sense, just sort of sticking with luxury, of how much some of the warnings that we're hearing of in the spirits and in the uh, watchmaking stocks indicate something broader? Well, you know, it's tough to say. I would point out that these are items that uh, were very popular during the pandemic. They may be subject to an ongoing reversal with some long and variable lags that you guys just mentioned. Um, but that said, I'm, uh, you know, those are just a couple of sectors. There's certainly others that are doing much better. You take a more cautious view here. You know, have you capitulated from a more hard landing, a more strident 2024? Have you eased that back or do you stand with a cautious view on disinflation? Well, here's the thing. Um, we have been pretty sanguine on the probability of a soft landing for at least a couple of months now. We don't really believe that has changed very much, but we still also believe that the tails of the distribution remain fatter than usual. And we do think that Heading right. into 2024, we could get a delayed but harder landing. You've got, but I love what you say here in your research note. You call it a slam on the brakes, 2024. How does a central bank as visible as the Fed, quote unquote, slam on the brakes? Well, we now all believe the Fed is done. What if inflation stays sticky and employment stays strong? They're trying to thread the needle now. They're worried that not only will inflation stay sticky, but yeah. employment might actually weaken considerably. What if that doesn't happen? And out front on this was Jim Bianco of Chicago, who was one of the first people to say to me what Sonia's saying here was, OK, celebration, and then we go level. That's what Lagarde's talking about. We the, go level. We the, don't keep going down. The gap, the range of potential outcomes <clears throat> is sort of shocking to me. And the fact that we've got some people on saying exactly what you're saying, the risk of accelerating inflation and growth is really significant. And other people saying we're going to head toward a hard landing and rates are going to go near where they were before, sort of as a benchmark rate with inflation, just highlights why you're seeing ping-ponging yields, because nobody can figure it out. What will be your guide to understand 
when that risk shifts and becomes a little more visible in terms of which of those two extremes we end up with? I think in terms of the economic data specifically, it's important to watch um, what happens with the potentially stickier components in the early 2024. <coughs> we know that some areas such as rent inflation, medical care, there, there are some dynamics there. They're just kind of base effects. Um, how will that play out in 2024 once those wane are important? And also what happens with the participation rate and with employment gains? Because a lot like we discussed here, a lot of the participation gains have been helpful in the, uh, you know, to contain some of the wage growth, but um, it's mostly come from foreign born workers. Will that continue in 2024? Do you have a sense of whether the long and variable lags are just very long or whether they've already been baked in a little bit more than people previously expected? Right. I mean, this has been one of the also big debates. And Chair Powell talked about this yesterday. He said it has been perpetually surprising how strong this economy is, given how much tightening we have done. Have we gotten any clarity on that whatsoever? I think this, the bigger corporates that have refinanced um, early during COVID are still doing very well, by and large. The the smaller businesses are suffering more, but for that to percolate into the broader economy right. may take a long time. Marcus on the move right now. Futures up 19. We're going to print 20 here on standard and poor's futures up four tenths of a percent. Dow up 144. I didn't do a fancy Fibonacci here, but we're basically 50 percent back to where we were before the carnage yesterday. The VIX lease is stunning. 14.88. The 10 year in a solid Five basis I'm glad you brought that up because we've seen this incredible volatility, particularly <clears throat> in benchmark full faith and credit yields. Does that affect the economic outlook in a material way? It could, but over time, because it does affect how corporates refinance themselves. The bigger the refinancing needs, the bigger the impact. And I do think that that's going to be a theme <clears throat> into 2024. Do the formulas work right now? Does, does, does the math work right now, or are we just making this up post-pandemic as we go? You know, so Dana Peterson, who was on here before, made a very mm -hmm. good point. The leading indicators are mostly predicated on the good sector, not services. And the big question right now is more in services. Um, will the services inflation remain sticky? What will employment be in services? So retail sales next week, that's a services view, even though we're buying goods. Well, I think it's both. I think it's both. But that, to me, highlights why this has been such a difficult period to get your hand around. I remember earlier this year we were talking about a rolling recession <coughs> and different industries that were going through downturns at a different time. <laughs> and there was this question of whether we would see some coalescing around some downturn or some recovery. Where are we in that sort of revolving chain of economic cycles that doesn't seem to be coming together? Well, it may be a longer cycle than we'd anticipated. It sounds like, at least through the end of the year, we're looking at still a pretty robust economy with potentially some gentle decelerating that could be welcome. 2024 is really the bigger question. I got a, I got a chart out here of the VIX, too quick to make it for television. Radio, this chart looks great on radio. And I got a double leg VIX move yesterday, Lisa. We just made back all of the Powell comments move, and now we attack the 30-year angst of yesterday. <laughs> well, right. I mean, this has been the volatility <laughs> with people trying to get a handle on how much to have faith. Just quickly, Sonia, you're saying next year is going to be when we see this massive deceleration. The, the lack of conviction <clears throat> around this, though, is shocking. How much conviction do you have that we're going to see a real drop-off and potentially downturn? You know, I think the, uh, people do expect some deceleration and potentially bigger <clears throat> one than is currently priced in. But I do think the big issue here is timing. Right. And because it's so difficult to time, it is also difficult to price in. Sonia, thank you so much for the brief here on a Friday. Sonia Meskin with us, BNY Mellon, uh, with some really good overview. Getting into the data uh, next week. Lisa, I, I, you know, you talk about whiplash, whipsaw. I mean, this is, ex seriously, you nailed the auction from 12 noon yesterday. Let's call it 21 hours, I guess. You nailed wow. the optimism that would be coming out today and that it was all over. So, hey, you know, tip hey, for tat, I'm borrowing just, from, you know. who am I borrowing from? Andrew Hollenhorst. Jan Hatzius and many others, something's in the air. It's not me. That's what it's a holiday are spirit. It's, coming it's a holiday together. spirit. Well, no, there's something in the air. I like how uh, Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America said that we've gone from bearish to full bull uh, pretty shortly. Oh, I like that. And I this miss idea that. of just, you know, greed yeah. taking over fear in a massive way. And a lot of people are saying, lean into it, you know? Yeah. I mean, embrace it because, you know, we only have so many well, months left we in will 2023. See. And Kumbaya. Thank you to all of you for John Farrow's interview with Christian Harner. We're going to lead with that on Monday. Joining us on Monday, 
a far more troubled leader of Formula One dealing with a difficult car, and also Sir Lewis. Toto Wolf will join us in the six o'clock hour on Monday before the Las Vegas Grand Prix. From New York, good morning.